And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. Schools in, bitches. Did what? Tell that guy to go fuck his mother. The guy's a fucking prick cock sucking fucking nothing. Fuck him. And everybody that looks like him, the dirty prick. Fuck him. Tell, tell him I said that. Tell, tell him I said go fuck himself. It's as simple as fucking that, huh? Yeah, welcome to Mob Talk Radio. I'm your host, Jeff Canarsie. And as you can tell, <laughs> I'm already fired up today. Uh, we are not going to do a, a usual show today. I, I know... Uh, in the, the past couple of months, we have done biographies and stuff like that. And we're going to be getting back to that. Uh, but what I am doing, <coughs> and I, I should, is, I might as well just announce this now, uh, is is we're going to do a huge Q&A, Q&A today. Uh, and then I'm going to take two weeks off. I'm, I'm going on a vacation again. Uh, and then I'm hoping that when I come back two weeks from now, uh, that I can announce something pretty big. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to like everything in life because, you know, the haters are going to say what they want to say, and I don't give a fuck what they think. But in life, everything is about negotiation. You know what I mean? So sometimes when a deal comes together or somebody offers you this or that, you know, there's always sort of a, 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 I want to say like a middle ground. This person wants this, I want that. And then you sort of kind of meet in the middle. Uh, And that's where I am as far as the platform goes, Uh, as far as what we're going to be doing. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about what what it is, who it's with, where it's going, just because I want to get to a point where I can say, okay, A, B, C, D, fucking E, F, G, H, and I. This is exactly what the deal is. Uh, and, and I don't want to uh, come out publicly with what I'm going to be doing until, you know, everything is signed, crossed, dot, dot the fucking I's, cross the fucking T's. Uh, and that's just the way it is. Now, uh, is, is there an opportunity or a chance that this particular i don't even like calling it fucking deal uh but if but if there's any chance this thing might not work out sometimes that 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 shit happens in life you know what i mean sometimes everything you try to do just doesn't work uh and so you know i'm I'm gonna wait till around the first second of september and you know if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out then then we we go to plan b and, and i already have a plan b uh we also have a lot of guests that are gonna be coming on the show the 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 pause I should say, and the reason why we haven't done any of that yet, uh, obviously I haven't recorded that yet. I got a whole list of people, but the thing is, is I wanted to debut that stuff on a new platform. Uh, not that I'm opposed to putting it on YouTube the, the way I've been doing things, but I just kind of, you know, when you move to a new platform, you want to do a, a couple of different things. And, and that's sort of the plan going forward is I want to release a lot of stuff. Now, uh, one of the questions I did get was this, uh, And and I'm just going to be honest about it. A lot of people have said, you know, if this moves to a new platform, is it free? Yes, it's going to be free. Not a problem there. Uh, What is going to change is I'm no longer going to waste my fucking time on idiots. uh, And I'm no longer just going to fight the battle that I've been fighting. I'm still going to defend my friends. I don't think that's ever going to stop. Uh, you'd, You'd have to kill me to do that. And then my fucking evil ghost is going to come back with a steel dildo and try to kill everybody anyway. Uh, so that's not going to change, but we're going to change how we do a couple of different things. Uh, we're going to do some sort of live call and stuff, uh, trying to figure out how we're going to do that. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of changes in some of the older shows that we did. Everything that's prior to when we move uh, is going to stay on YouTube. It's not going to go nowhere. It's going to stay there, uh, but you'll have to get the new shows somewhere else, obviously. Uh, and, and so as we move closer to like the beginning of September and believe me, if anybody's sick and fucking tired of talking about this, it's me. Uh, I was ready to go yesterday with this nonsense, but things happen. You know, when, when you go to work for a, a big company, you know, the ball is in their court. They, they can offer you a deal and you can choose to accept it or not accept it. Uh, and when you do accept that, there's always, you know, fine details that go back and forth between what this person expects and wants and what you do. Uh, and, and so the reality of that is when you move to a new platform, a new big company, whatever the case may be, you know, it's in their timeline, not mine. 
Uh, if there is any mistake I made, I should have just not announced that we were possibly moving as early as I did. But I was excited. So what the fuck are you going to do? Sue me. Everybody else wants to sue me. Why not you? Uh, so all that being said, that's what we're going to do with that. There is a change on Facebook, which I'm going to just get into very quickly before we take a break. Uh, because somebody here is pointing to me that, that the person I was yapping about when we first started the show sent another message. So I'm going to go to war during the fucking break. Uh, but one of the things I've had to do on Facebook was get rid of the Q and a questions there. Uh, now, as far as like how you submit them, that's the only thing that's changed. Uh, usually on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, if you go over to Facebook, type in mob talk radio, you will see uh, Q and a uh, shoot or Q and a time, go for it. And then everybody starts posting their questions, uh, obviously there. A lot of people were sending them to me via messenger, on the mob talk page the problem with that isn't that i don't mind taking time but when you're trying to fucking sleep at one o'clock in the morning and every 10 seconds pingity ping 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 motherfucking ping and you've got 400 fucking questions it's a pain in the fucking ass I listen i love talking to the people that listen to my show and support it and everybody who donates to it that's great but i just don't have the time to answer if it's something short and sweet i don't mind doing it but I can't answer every question. And most of them are repeated. Some of them are different. Some people just want to talk to me about other things and I get it. So as long as you just post your questions in the Q and a post on Facebook, and I don't have a problem with it. Do that shit all fucking day long, post 10 different questions. If you want, that doesn't bother me. Uh, but when it gets to my inbox, that's when it becomes hectic. And, and I said it the other day to somebody, I said, Jesus fucking Christ, I got 500 fucking messages. I like to even answer five of them, which were in-depth questions took me an hour. And so I, I just, I don't have the time to do it. And at the same time, I don't want to fucking hire somebody to do that. Uh, because then all they're doing is transcribing what I tell them the answer is. And, and it's still the same, it's still the same fucking problem. It's the, the difference is, is I'm not texting it or typing it. Somebody else is, and, and I don't want to put somebody through that either. Uh, and if people, you know, obviously, and I hate to say this, but if people continue, uh, to dump questions into my inbox, I'm just going to get rid of the inbox uh, period end of story. Then I don't even have to deal with it. But the reason why I'm keeping the inbox there is because I like to interact with everybody. Uh, I think a lot of other people that do this stuff I, and I see, and I'm not comparing myself to nobody out there, but I think that a lot of these other podcasts, vlogging, whatever the fuck this nonsense is, it's going on. And we'll get to a little bit of that today. Uh, is I see how they interact with their fans. And yeah, you're not always going to agree. People are going to attack you, and I get it. But some of the shit that I see, especially on YouTube, uh, with them just attacking people that, that ask them tough questions. Like, you're not going to keep a fucking fan base. You're not going to keep your listeners up if when somebody asks you a question, you tell them to go fuck their dead mother. Uh, and this is what I see going on. Uh, so in that particular instance, if, if you're going to have that kind of agita with people, uh, then, then, then maybe you're better off, like not even fucking interacting with your people. I'll be honest with you. Uh, so what I try to do is I try to interact with everybody. Uh, sometimes it's peaceful. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes people goad me into fucking mouthing off. Uh, but that's the reality. So I'm going to go on vacation for two weeks after this show. I'm hoping to come back, uh, and be able to announce something. God fucking willing at this fucking point. Uh, and we are going to talk, we are going to actually do a biography as well as a Q&A and some, some other kind of things on uh, Facebook. Uh, we are actually, uh, as far as the biographies go, and that's the other thing I wanted to say before, before I say this next thing. Uh, one of the things that we will do on the new platform is uh, the old shows are, like I said, always going to be there, etc. I don't know if we're going to upload some of the older shows to that new platform or if I'm just going to re-record, redo them and get a little more in depth with them. That may be the route we go. So is some stuff going to be repeated with some updates? Yeah, absolutely. That's going to be the case. Uh, when you're 140 shows, whatever the fuck it is in, you know, it's not that you ever run out of fucking material, but the bottom line is, you know, it gets a little stagnant. You got to change things up a little bit. But when we come back in two weeks, uh, we are going to be talking about John Montana, who was a Buffalo tough guy, a union shark, a political fixer. Uh, he was he was actually a politician uh, who ended up becoming the underboss of the consigliere uh, of the Buffalo crime family. Uh, he was one of Russell Buffalino's closest allies and friends. 
Uh, you're not going to want to miss that show. It's pretty good. A lot of people probably don't know who this fucking guy is. Uh, but a lot of the knowledge that Buffalino was able to acquire at a young age, young age uh, directly came from Montana. So all that being said, that is what's going on. Uh, one last thing, Instagram people. Uh, I am on Instagram. It's only for the radio show. I don't have a personal fucking Instagram. Uh, I just social media to this point. It's just gotten a little bit ridiculous for me personally. Uh, but if I don't know you on Instagram, I'm not going to accept you. Now, a lot of people may argue that that's the kind of stupid thing to do in this day and age, but there's so many different people out there and I kind of like to keep it. I, I kind of want to keep it a, a tight knit group. Uh, I will be giving over my Instagram to somebody else to run. Uh, so if you have been messaging me through Instagram, you better figure out another way to do it because I'm not going to be uh, running the Instagram. I'm going to let somebody else do that for me just so I can focus more on some of the stuff that I want to do, uh, including I have two different radio shows that will be coming out. Uh, one of them, you know what, I'm not even going to get into the details with it because uh, that's the, the details on that are still being ironed out. It's completely different than what you hear here. It's, it's going to be a comedy, funny thing. Uh, I have yet to figure out what we're going to call it, but I have two people that are going to get involved with that. Uh, one specifically uh, who I'm just going to call Boston Andy. Uh, him and I are going to do a show together, which is going to be absolutely curse-filled, repulsive, uh, sort of everything you kind of get here, but just uh, different aspects. So if you wanted to know who the fuck I am in real life, which this is who I am, but there's going to be some stories that are going to be told. And we're, we're kind of working out the details on that uh, as we speak. So the other one, the other show, I'm, I'm just not even going to mention at this point, but all that being said, we got a lot of stuff going on. So stay tuned to Mob Talk Radio. We will be back and we will start the Q&A. On a given week, I'm out of town a lot. Uh, whether it's Philadelphia, it's New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, wherever the case may be, I'm always looking for a place where I can sit down and have a great dinner. Uh, ambiance is key. Price is obviously key. But the most important thing is, is the food good? And there's a place I want to tell you about today. It's called Saltwater at Margate. Uh, if you are going down to the shore, because I know a lot of people in Philadelphia go to the shore, uh, especially Margate, you're missing out on a great restaurant if you haven't been there. Uh, the name is Saltwater Margate. It's at 9401 Ventnor Avenue, Margate City, New Jersey. Uh, the phone number there is 609-289-8078. You can also visit them online at saltwatermargate.com. This place is unbelievable. Not only is the food absolutely superb, the price is great too. Uh, they're renowned for their pizza and their gnocchi. Uh, they have all kinds of different things from mussels to roast pork and Italian fare. So do yourself a favor. Do me a favor. Go and visit Saltwater Margate. You will not be disappointed. Uh, it is a place that I think at some point, if not already, there's going to be lines out the door and around the block. So if you're down on the shore, stop in, go to Saltwater Margate. At least check them out online at saltwatermargate.com. I know at times we like to have a lot of fun on this show, but it's time to get serious about one thing. I know that the coronavirus pandemic has hurt a lot of my listeners and their businesses. Restaurants have been ordered to close, gyms have been ordered to close, cigar lounges have been ordered to close, and even bars have been ordered to close. These are small businesses that don't always have the cash reserves to continue making their rent or mortgage payments. They can't even pay their vendors. My good friend Mike Kaysen of Kaysen & Kaysen is an experienced bankruptcy lawyer that is there to help you right now. Kaysen & Kaysen represents individuals and small businesses in complex bankruptcy proceedings in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, and Miami. Give Mike a call at 646-397-6226. And if you mention Mob Talk Radio, he's going to give you a free consultation. Once again, it's Mike Kaysen of Kaysen & Kaysen, 646-397-6226. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to be taking your questions and answering them. Obviously, uh, I state this all the time. Uh, if I don't get to your question, uh, chances are it's likely because I've answered it a million fucking times. That's number one. Uh, and number two, sometimes these questions are just too too much in depth for me to to really answer in one sitting. I'm going to try to get to do like fucking 80 questions today out of like the, the 270 that I actually got. Uh, so, uh, how, how, how do you get your questions submitted? Uh, you simply go to Facebook, excuse me, 
You simply go to Facebook, type in Mob Talk Radio, go there, and you will see Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of every week, Q&A and go. And that's where you're, you're going to put it. If I've answered your question before, I probably will not answer it again. Uh, we will be doing another show where we talk about uh, some of the rehashed questions that I do get. I got like a thousand sitting in a file that I'll have to comb through. Uh, So all that being said, uh, also, this is an announcement. I am no longer going to answer any questions about who could beat up who, uh, who could outshoot who. Uh, I think we're better than that. And I I think the questions are funny, but I just think that rather than spending time asking or answering questions that uh, really are not really totally relevant, I, because when I do that, then that means someone else, someone else is getting bypassed. Somebody who wants to ask a question that, that maybe didn't have the opportunity to do so. So. This is the last time I'm going to read a question like this. All right. Who would win in a street fight between Tommy Agro or Anthony Mira? Uh, I think Anthony Mira, but could you imagine him and Tommy Agro like in a standoff in an alley cursing at each other, holding knives? Jesus Christ, talk about carnage. Uh, But there you go. All right. Uh, Some trolls are, okay, I don't want to touch that one. Okay, so these, so one of the things that I got this week was a, a couple of different questions. Normally, the, the amount of personal questions I get are, are pretty limited to a scope of just, you know, how I got involved in this, who do I know, et cetera, et cetera. But every once in a while, uh, you know, people will come across stuff on the internet uh, that, that's laden with lies and bullshit and nonsense. And, and I get questions and I usually don't answer them, but this week I'm going to do it only because I feel like, you know, I'm not trying to hide from an answer or nothing like that. Uh, but I just kind of like to leave the personal shit with me. I mean, if you obviously don't know me, don't hang out with me, don't bounce with me or nothing, then you obviously, you know, don't know me. So I try to answer some of these uh, in terms of just letting people kind of get to know who I am, you know, because you can only judge a book by its cover and, and, and having experience reading that book. Right. So all these people that pretend to know me don't uh, and, and anybody that, that does hang out with me knows the, the difference between the two. So. Uh, the first one is, can you tell me the story, the, the Philly story again about your father going nuts in Philadelphia? It's hilarious and we all need a laugh. Uh, yeah, so I told this story before. Uh, for those that, that do know and, and do not know, my father passed away in uh, 2004 of cancer. Uh, and my father, if I had to characterize him, he was one point, he was one part John Cleese. Uh, he was one part Gilbert Godfrey. Uh, Godfrey, one part Andrew Dice Clay, one part Clark Griswold from the Vacation Series star in Chevy Chase. Uh, my father was a lot of different things. Uh, tough guy a little bit. Now, when I say tough guy, I mean, you know, not, I'm not talking about a guy that went down to the corner and beat people up. But he's tough. He was a tough individual, uh, but he had a sense of humor like fucking wicked quick, wicked fast, wicked hilarious. Uh, and that's sort of where I get some of who I have become uh, throughout my 43 years of life. Uh, so anyway, the, the long end of it is, is that we were in South Philadelphia, and I can't remember whether we were Geno's or Pat's, uh, to be honest with you. Now, first of all, when I'm typically down there, I don't eat that stuff anyway because it, it's touristy. Uh, but listen, if you're hungover, you're drinking, it's perfect. Throw it in your belly. The, the oil coats your fucking stomach. You know, you pay for it two fucking hours later when you either can't shit or you have the fucking diarrhea on the side of the fucking Jersey Turnpike. Been there, done that. So not that I'm trying to say anything bad about Pat's or Geno's, uh, but – we were there, and I'm trying to remember for the life of me, uh, you know, obviously, uh, I don't want to get really specific here, but I have family in Philadelphia, uh, specifically, like, not in South Philly. It's outside of South Philly, near uh, near the airport, Wallingford uh, area, uh, Swarthmore area, stuff like that. Uh, and so I forgot why we were there, to be honest with you. I don't know if we were we was at an Eagles game going to an Eagles game or or what the, why the fuck we were there? Cause my father going to Philadelphia, first of all, uh, you know, probably wasn't going to happen. You know, he didn't like to go to New York. He didn't like Philadelphia. You know, he loved Rhode Island and Boston, but everything else was like fucking nonsense to him. So, uh, like I said, I'm racking my brain trying to remember why the fuck we were there to begin with. Maybe we went, I don't know if we went to a Phillies game. Or whether we went to a Flyers game. I, I, don't, I hate the fucking Flyers, by the way. I'm a Penguins fan. But the Flyers are in the playoffs. They're going to do well. They did well all season long. Uh, 1976 for all you South Philly Flyers fans. Fuck, fuck the Flyers. That's, you know, that's my stance, and I'm sticking to it on that. But I love the fucking Eagles. Don't get me wrong. Uh, so we were, anyway, the, I, who gives a fuck why we were there? We were just there. 
uh, my father, I, I would love to tell you that my father had a uh, patience of a saint. He didn't. My father was explosive. Uh, my father didn't tolerate fucking nonsense. And when he would react, he did. He always didn't react in, in sort of the kind of way that the most typical fathers were. Usually it was a, uh, you know, you get that you get that frustration sigh. Uh, you know, he, uh, and then right after that came the motherfucker, this, that, and the third you fucking Jesus Christ cocksucker. That's just the way he talked. Uh, an interesting story. This is a side note. And then I'll get to the question. I apologize for this. I just did this, this memory. So when I was a kid, I was playing youth hockey. All right. And one of the things uh, about playing youth hockey is first of all, it, it, me and all my siblings started playing hockey when we were little kids. That's just the reality of it. Uh, my father didn't want me to play. He thought I was too small. Cause when I was a kid, I was like a bean. They, my nickname was bean when I was a little kid, just because I was so small, so skinny. Uh, they said, if I could turn sideways, you wouldn't see me at all. I was just a little tiny wiry kid. Uh, and my father was concerned I would get hurt. Uh, and ultimately he was definitely wrong about that. Uh, but you know, that's what parents do. And we had a coach who was banging one of the team moms. Uh, and the problem was in this, this youth hockey league that I was playing in, uh, was that they had way too many kids. Uh, usually, you know, Bantam, Midget, Might, Mini Mites. Uh, they break everything up in age categories, not by size, it's by age. So you could have some kids that were playing juniors or seniors that are six foot five, 220 pounds, but you could have another kid the same fucking age that's like five, six, 130 pounds. Uh, and, and you're talking a full checking league. So this isn't like a league where you just, there's no contact. I mean, it's full on fucking contact. Uh, you know, and, and I made up for whatever size differential I might have had uh, by beating the shit out of people. And that's just the truth. That's what I did. I was tough. I was a defenseman and I was a tough kid. Uh, I didn't tolerate no shit from nobody. I, I learned at a very young age that if you can't outskate them, you better fucking out hit them and you better out punch them. And, and that's just the reality of it. Uh, so anyway, this this particular coach. Uh, we just had too many people on the fucking team. I mean, you had a team of like, because I think they had, I, I want to say it was midgets. We were not midgets in the sense of short, but it's it's a specific kind of uh, like age thing, like when T-ball, Mustangs, you know, all that kind of nonsense, senior league baseball shit like that. Uh, but midgets, I think, typically is like fifteen to seventeen, and I think, or or even eighteen. I uh, maybe maybe nineteen. It goes fifteen to nineteen, or usually I think the cutoff's fucking eighteen. Uh, and anyway, the the coach was banging the team mom, so of course all her kids are gonna fucking play. Uh, and one of the things that had happened was they were, they were cutting people from playing in the game because there was like 30 guys. Typically you have 20, 21 on a team. We had like 30 for some reason. And this asshole decided that certain people weren't going to play. You can't do that in a, in a fucking youth league, uh, because parents are paying too much money. And he did, he tried to fuck me. Uh, and you know, as a typical kid, you know, you're hot, you're pissed off, you know, and, and I said something to my father. And what my father ended up doing was he walked down, he went inside the fucking rink, walked all the way down to the locker room, banged on the fucking door. Guy answers the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My father's like, you know, so you think you're going to tell kids they can't play? You know, we're paying all this fucking money. And he said something snarky to my father. I can't remember what it was. But my father grabbed him by the fucking throat and threw him up against the wall and started screaming obscenities like you have no fucking idea. Uh, and then proceeded to throw the guy against the fucking the, the locker much to everybody's fucking shock and dismay, including my own, uh, which gave me kind of a little smirk, you know, because, you know, there's my father being a tough guy. But uh, he walks out and then he takes all the fucking hockey sticks and throws them on the fucking ice. <laughs> there was a game going on. He picks up like fucking 40 sticks and just starts fucking chucking them over the fucking boards, over the glass, into the ice, screaming, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> oh, my father was a nut job. He was a nut job, but... I got to play. Uh, so anyway, let me get to your question. Uh, so we're in Philadelphia and you know, my, my brother, my brother, Tony said to my father, he goes, pop, listen, let me order for you. You know, because listen, when you get in line at these places, there's a line around the block. These people don't want no nonsense. It's like with or without plain and simple with or without either you want whiz or mayo or you fucking don't or whatever the case may be. So of course my brother's, my, my father's like, I can order for myself. I was in fucking Vietnam, bronze star, silver star, uh, recipient. I was in Nam. I could kill somebody with my bare hands. That's just how my father was. I could handle it. So my brother gets up, 
you know, he gets his with or without. I can't remember. I get up with or without. And my father steps up. And I don't know if he did this fucking intentionally or not. I don't know if he was just so fucking outraged that he was told how to fucking order something uh, or whether or not he was just being genuinely fucking confused about the fucking deal. Uh, so he steps up. The guy goes, yeah, what do you want? You know, typical South Philly sort of, you know, what can we do for you kind of a deal. Uh, and my father starts ordering this thing like it, like it's a fucking drive through at McDonald's. Uh, he's like, yeah, steak sandwich. Uh, I want cheese. Uh, I want fucking onions. And the guy goes, next. Like, wouldn't even fucking tolerate my goddamn father trying to order. And my father goes from sort of, you know, having the Irish skin, white skin. He went from, like, fucking white to fucking plaid in three seconds. And I look at him, and I see his eyes bulging. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. I said, Tony, look at Pop. He's about to kill this fucking prick. And my father said, I don't think you know who I am. And first of all, he's playing the you don't know who I am game in South Philly where nobody knows who the fuck, you know, who the fuck he is. Uh, the guy's like, yeah, whatever, dude, next, you know. And my father starts screaming his order at 100 miles an hour. And finally exacerbated by this whole situation, the guy finally just does it just to get my father the fuck out of the way. And of course, everybody in the fucking line is being entertained by this shit. Uh, so then my father gets the fucking sandwich and he goes to sit down. He's going to get the pickles, the whatever the fuck. And he sets it down. And he stands up and goes, I'll be right back. And I'm like, pop, what the fuck are you doing? Tony and my brother, Tony's like, pop, what are you doing? He's like, I, I just got to go say one more thing. And it's like, oh fuck. Maybe he's going to apologize. You know, my father's, you know, a military guy. He's fairly polite under most fucking circumstances. Right. And so maybe he's going to apologize. And we're within, I don't know, fucking 20 feet of where you order. So it's not like we can't hear my father. So he gets up. He walks over to the guy. He just looks at him and goes, hey, you. He's like, yeah. He's like, Rocky ain't fucking real. And he walks away. My father thought that was the most hilarious shit. Then he sits down to explain to me, my brother, and everybody else within sitting distance of this shit how Rocky is fake and Philadelphians don't realize that Rocky is not real. And he goes on a diatribe for 10 minutes about how it's fake, fake. Rocky's fake. You worship somebody who's a fake. And needless to say, we went from sitting down, minding our fucking business to picking up our shit and going to the car to eat because I think my father was probably 20 seconds from being killed. Uh, so that's sort of what happened. My father was good for stuff like that. Uh, he just, you know, he had a way about him and, and, you know, I, I, I missed that. I missed that about him because I wonder, I think he would, he would have been 80 years old this year. Uh, and I often wonder as cranky as he fucking was in his late fifties and early sixties, my fucking God, the shit he would probably do now. Cause I would have loved to put him in a track suit, you know, at 80 years old and just let him go walk the dog in a track suit just to see the reaction he would get and the shit he would say to people. What the fuck you looking at? You never seen a guy walk a fucking dog? But so there you go. All right. Sorry about that long winded uh, question there. All right. So some trolls are posting a lot of stuff about your family. And while I'm respectful enough not to prod into your personal life, what is or what was the issue with you and your brother or brothers? I think setting the record straight will put these assholes to rest. Um, well, first of all, it's it, it, listen. Uh, that's not for public consumption, but I'm going to answer this and, and I'm going to answer it only because, you know, somebody was nice enough to just ask politely and not fucking prod me and poke me about it. Uh, listen, so in any family, you have a dynamic, right? You know, they, listen, siblings fight. Siblings don't get along. Siblings, you know, the, we change over time. Uh, there's probably some things that in my past that I did uh, that that my brother particularly didn't like. Uh, and, and that's okay. I mean, you know, but I also think at the same time in saying that everybody makes mistakes. Some of us make them fucking repeatedly. Uh, and, and, and that's the reality of it. But what, what really happened was they didn't like me doing the show and for a lot of different reasons. Okay. That's number one. Uh, and where it sort of kind of got even worse was there were a bunch of newspaper articles that tied me with mafia, this mafia, that, uh, Angel Gotti this, Angel Gotti that. Uh, then, you know, there were some other things that went down. But more or less what happened was I got a fucking text from him. 
uh, you know, tell them, yeah, to, to see you doing this show and now you're hanging out with made guys. What are you fucking nuts? You're going to get our whole family killed. But, you know, just uh, listen, he has kids. He's, he's got a right to be to, to, to be concerned, but he forgets how he grew up. And, and that's sort of the problem. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to bypass those thoughts when you're related to people. Uh, it's different when, you know, it's your brother and he's not with your people and he's with other people. And, and so the long end of it is, is that he felt that my exposure in the newspaper, he felt that, that me being associated with this one and that one uh, made him look bad in some kind of way, uh, put his job in jeopardy some kind of way. Uh, but what it really came down to was he felt like I was hanging out with people that were dangerous uh, he felt I was dangerous and he felt like I was, uh, I mean, I'm going to use his words here. Uh, he felt like I was a danger to his children, my nieces and nephews and to him. Uh, that probably is a little bit of a head case type of fucking reaction. It's a knee jerk reaction. I get it. Uh, but that's his life. You know, he has to live his fucking life the way he feels he should. Uh, do I think I'm a danger to my nieces and nephews? Cause I know people No. Uh, am I a danger to him because I got a fucking nasty temper and I will punch him in the fucking face? Absolutely. Uh, but you know, it's just one of those things where there's, you know, uh, listen, I'm 43 years old. You know, my, I think my brother just turned 50. Uh, and, and you know, we have a history of obviously at least for 40, at least for 40, 42 years of my life. So you're not always going to get along with people. Uh, it's a shame, but you got to move on from it. Uh, the, I, I don't pay that shit no attention. I don't pay it no mind. In fact, I was telling somebody in South Philadelphia about the situation a couple months ago. Uh, just that, uh, you know, what happened? Because a lot of people know that there was some friction and stuff like that. And and when I told this guy that the, the story, he just kind of looked at me and says, it doesn't matter what the fuck you did if you didn't hurt nobody. He says, how can a brother bail on his brother like that? How can a brother bail on a brother? And that's news to me, too, because my father didn't raise us to be that way. Neither did my mother, you know, so uh, I, I, I don't know. But whatever it is, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I've moved past that in my life. I wish nobody but the best, obviously. But I don't give a fuck either. Uh, if you ain't going to pay my bills, don't tell me how to fucking earn. And that's what I've said my whole life. Uh, and, and that is that. That's all, that's all there is to that. All right. Uh, when did you first come to understand the mafia, its existence and or the idea of it? Uh, particularly, you know, to be honest with you, I, I can't really, I, there was an instance of it and, and I'm got to be careful with these details a little bit. So I grew up a certain kind of way. You see things, you notice things and, and, and that's not really a sign of anything. Uh, you hear whispered conversations and stuff like this. This one disappeared. Nobody's seen them. You know, you hear stuff like that. You meet kind of people that don't go to work every day and they got all this money living in million dollar houses. So you kind of put two and two together. But when I kind of realized it was, Probably when I was a kid, uh, my brother, one of my brothers, I'm not going to say which one, uh, took me to a video store. And this is before, like, you know, obviously Netflix, block, before even Blockbuster even. Uh, and we went, he's like, oh, come on. I think in them days it was $2.75 uh, to, to rent a fucking movie for like a week. Uh, and, and so we went, he's like, oh, we're going to, you pick out one. I'll pick out one. And I, you know, I picked out some fucking stupid ninja shit. I can't even remember what the fuck it was, but I remember what he picked out and it was good fellas. Uh, I probably was too young to watch that kind of shit. Cause I think I was like eight or nine at the time. Uh, we went home and watched it and I started recognizing not necessarily themes, but I started recognizing relatives <laughs> like very hey he talks like uncle this one he talks hey he acts like my second cousin this one and then and then i remember i'll never forget halfway through the pause button is hit one of my siblings looks at me and says does this seem familiar to you whatsoever and i looked at him and was kind of like well yeah that reminds me of so and so so and so and he looks at me and says do you get it now and I'm like sort of confused. And of course, my father walks into the fucking room. Hey, isn't that your uncle so-and-so? What a prick. And that, then I knew immediately. Then I knew immediately. And then, as, then as I got older, uh, I started seeing things for myself. I, my father told me some stories. Even my mother told me some stories. So I started putting two and two together. That's sort of how... Uh, I, I, I got introduced to that, uh, you know, people that, that don't like me, I'll tell you the opposite, but they don't, they don't know a thing about me. So there you go. 
All right. Any funny stories you could tell about your man? A lot of family questions today. All right. Any funny stories you could tell about your family? Uh, yeah, I could tell you two really quick off the top of my head. Um, maybe one of the reasons why my brother doesn't like me uh, or has some discontent is when he was at his first when he we, when he got ma- you know, married for the first time. He's I think he's married second time. I don't know. I wasn't invited to that one. Uh, but when he got married uh, to somebody in college, and I don't want to say that person's name, but. Uh, we were at the uh, reception, uh, and I don't think I was 21. I think it was like 19, uh, 19, 19, I think I was 19, but I was a, a young looking 19, so I shouldn't have been fucking drinking beer. Uh, but you know, when it's open bar and you know, everybody there, you know, people, people go up, Hey, I'm going to the bar. What do you want? I was like, Oh, I can't, I'm not old enough. Yeah, you can, you know? So they would bring back, I think it was Heineken. I was drinking, uh, I got fucking lit. Like, completely fucking lit. So, so bad that my father's like, Jesus Christ, son, you're fucking, you're fucking 19. You can't even stand up straight. What the fuck is wrong with you? Well, so we had a good time. And then he's like, hey, you want a cigar? I'm going to go get some cigars. Say, all right, pop. And he, like, drove, like, 25 miles to get fucking cigars, which was perfect. Uh, so, as we're walking out, I don't know why I did it. But I decided to dump an entire beer on my brother's fucking head as he's walking out with his wife. He's in a tux. She's in the fucking wedding dress. And I'm standing there in a tux and I dump a beer all over the, his fucking head just for, the, just for the sake of doing it. I don't know why I did it. I was drunk. What are you going to do? And uh, so I thought I got away with it. And then like six months goes by and he calls me irate. And he's like, uh, you know, you know what my fucking cleaning bill for that tux was? I said, what are you talking about? You dumped beer on my head. No, I fucking didn't. What I didn't realize was that one of my uncles or my aunts or my cousins, I don't know who took the photo, but somebody took a photo as they were fucking walking out of the reception. There I am, beer dumping out of the fucking bottle right on his fucking head. I couldn't get away with it. I've never lived that down. I probably still owe him that bill. I'm not paying for that shit. Fuck it. You got all, you're loaded. You're rich. You live in an exclusive area just outside of Philly. So fuck it. You pay for the fucking shit. But yeah, uh, another story... Uh, you know, nah, I'm not going to. So when my father uh, married my mother, uh, they used to go uh, up on Federal Hill to see my great grandfather. Uh, and my father, the first time he went with my grandfather, sat and, you know, had a couple drinks and just talked. And, you know, my father was not a big scotch drinker at all. My father drank beer a little bit, but he really wasn't a big, big drinker. But Every time he would go, they'd give him a little scotch and he would force himself to drink the shit. But he he faked it so fucking well that my great grandfather thought he loved it. So every time my father was in, you know, around Federal Hill, come on over and have a scotch. And my father would fucking dread it. Uh, and, and, and so what would end up happening is every year they would buy him scotch. He doesn't drink the shit. But my great grandfather thought that he loved it so much. But but the reality is. He was going out of respect, half out of really out of respect, but out of fear as well. Uh, you just when you were asked to go, you went and that was the end of it. And he would sit there and sip that goddamn scotch. And, and sometimes he would try to down it really quick just to fucking get it out of his his way. And of course, here comes the fucking bottle tipped over again. And he told me he would end up getting shit faced drunk. Much to the laughter of my great grandfather and my grandfather. So, all right, there you go. All right, with the ongoing rumors from those two idiots down in Philadelphia, do you ever expect an indictment to come down? And if it does, how bad is it going to be for those guys down there? So, we've been hearing about this indictment, a lack thereof, impending uh, for like at least three years, right? I, I think the reality is this. Uh, it's not hard to say, oh, an indictment's coming because reality is. Reality is an indictment will come at some fucking point. Uh, what really matters when it comes to the terms of that question is how bad and who. If it's fringe people, it's not a big deal. If it's, if it's powerful people and they have a rat, then that's a big fucking problem. But uh, at the same time that I say that, I've also told you, and I will stand by it, much to the probably the, the, the chagrin of people down there, uh, is that you cannot crack, you cannot move, you cannot dent, you cannot damage, you cannot fracture something that is built so fucking strong. Nobody can crack that. 
it's going to take a real piece of shit to do something like that. So it, will there be an indictment? I'm sure, but it's, it's going to be minor shit. Uh, because the reality is, is you could have a thousand eyes on you, but if you're not doing nothing, the fuck, then they can't indict you for nothing. Uh, so listen, yeah, a, a lot of people are going to uh, say an indictment's coming, but until one does, or uh, uh, until we start to hear anything, it doesn't really fucking matter. Uh, you can't catch the rabbit if you never see him. It's just the way I see things. All right, what is the biggest misconception about mob guys, and what? Do, why do people love supporting these rats all over the internet? Uh, the biggest conception is that there's something outer worldly or they're superheroes or they're, uh, you know, bigger than life. I mean, some guys have bigger than life personalities, but the reality is, is that, listen, uh, Joey Bats is just as normal as Fred, who goes to fucking work at, at, at a fucking accountant firm every day. They're the same guys. They have families. They have the same problems, the same concerns, the same dreams, the same goals, the same fears, the same sadness, the same sorrow. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. The The, the problem is, is that people seem to put them in a, a stratosphere that does not fucking exist. And that's because of God, the Godfather, Goodfellas, and, and films. Films put it a certain way. Uh, the only difference, the only difference between Joey Pipes or Jimmy Hatchet excuse me, Jimmy Hatchet and Fred is that Joey Pipes and Jimmy Hatchet will fucking kill you. That's the difference. They still have the same problems. They still got to feed their kids. They still worry about their kids. Uh, they still got to feed the dog, walk the fucking dog. They still wipe their ass like everybody else does. Uh, the difference is they fucking will kill you. There you go. And they're serious people. They don't tolerate nonsense and bullshit. Uh, and that is a huge misconception. The other misconception is that they all kill people and they're dumb. I have met uh, probably, I, this is, I, you know, I can't be fucking exact, 70, 80 made guys in my life. Uh, and not a single one of them was dumb. They all had IQs you would not fucking believe. You got to be smart to fucking beat the system. And this day and age especially Look at how they're beating the system. Some guys don't beat the system. Some guys go away the rest of their life. And usually that's not because they've been caught. It's because they got a rat. And the thing is, is what a rat says doesn't even have to be fucking verified. In most cases, they don't even need a rat, but they need a rat to explain the bullshit to like be a fucking interpreter. And they all tailor their fucking testimony. Anybody that tells you they don't, it's out of their fucking mind. Uh, so the big misconception is that these guys aren't smart. These guys, if they chose not to live the way that they chose to live, uh, could run Fortune 500 companies, multi-millionaire, uh, millionaire, 10 times over. But guess what? It's the streets. The streets has got action. The streets has got juice. The streets are fun. Listen, if I told you tomorrow, and then this goes for everybody, if I told you tomorrow, I'm going to put you out on the street. I just want you to do one or two things for me. You're going to make $150,000. Or you go to work for the next 40 fucking years at, at fucking Wendy's. What are you going to do? Most people are going to take option one. But not everybody's built for option one. And that's that's the difference. Uh, and as far as supporting the rats uh, all over the internet, listen, it's like anything else, right? So the, the closest that, that the majority of people who, who listen to my show, uh, the majority of people who listen to any mafia-related shit or read a book, the closest you're going to get to that life is experience it through movies reading a fucking book or you know listening to shows right uh the majority of people have no idea what it's like to be around the streets they have no idea what it's like to be around a serious fucking guy who's got a temper who isn't going to tolerate no bullshit there's so many politics that people are so unaware of in the streets uh it just it, listen even with my show right and i'll be honest there's politics with my show if you think there's not politics with the show you're out of your fucking mind uh it's not as easy as fucking okay look this up look this up hit play hit record just fucking talk it's not that simple uh i have to be very careful about what i do i have to be very careful about who i associate with i have to be very careful when i go to this social club that social club i have to be very careful when i use my phone with with somebody here somebody there it's not as simple as you think it is. And so what you have is a lot of jerk offs and, and it's not everybody. It's like 2% of the people I'm talking about. 
But you have these jerk offs who love and support the fucking rats because the closest they're going to get to that life is listening to somebody who at one point in their life lived it. The problem is the majority of these fucking people that are talking on these shows. Yeah, they lived it, but they are not who they want you to believe. First of all. Uh, they're still criminals. You're always a fucking criminal. Once a criminal, always a criminal. Anybody that le- believes in uh, reformation is out of their fucking mind. If you think that uh, Johnny Ballsack fucking robbing banks for 20 years and killing people for uh, contract murders for the mob, all of a sudden wakes up one day and goes, Jesus spoke to me. He's forgiven me of my sins. Now I'm going to be a preacher. If you believe that that shit's realistic and that's honest, then you're stupider than I ever fucking thought. Because reality is a criminal will always be a fucking criminal. Doesn't matter. There's no such thing as, ah, I woke up today and decided I would not kill blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they then they like to enhance uh, who they are. I am not against anybody. I'm not against anybody making money the easy fucking way. Trust me. However, what I have a problem with is when you're not honest about what you were in the streets, and you try to insert yourself into every historical aspect of the mafia that you were never in. And I'm not talking about one person. There's a bunch of them that do this. Uh, But that's the thing, and and that's the problem. People support them because it's the closest they're ever going to get. They have wet wet fantasies and, and joygasms when these guys talk to them. But the reality is, and it's like I said at the top of the show, excuse me, is that the way they treat their listeners, the way that they treat people that, that that aren't even being like I used the reference for like Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump standing there. You can get somebody from CNN or wherever else asks him sort of a question not to demean him, but just a point blank question. Do you regret this? Or, you know, contrary to what you're saying, this is what else this is what is being said. Uh, I know Trump's a, a bad comparison to this, but they don't react well to that. They don't want to be challenged. Every day I get messages from people saying to me, oh, why don't you debate this one and that one? They want nothing to fucking do with me. They Listen, first of all, I'm relevant. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. I'm relevant in this genre. I'm relevant in this sort of thing. Uh, but they don't want to, they, 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 that's why they won't have me. They don't want to be confronted with the truth. They can't think quick on their feet. And that's fine. I don't want to, first of all, even if they asked, I wouldn't fucking do it. You couldn't put me in the same room with one or two of those guys because it would be over with in 20 seconds. I start punching the fuck out of them in their throats with a fucking pen. There's just no way I would do it. But, you know, friendly debates aside, they're, they're never going to offer me that because they don't want the fucking truth. They want to keep manipulating you. They want to keep taking your fucking money and they want you to think they're lucky Luciano when the truth remains. They were fucking really nothing at the bottom end of the spectrum. All right. If Capone doesn't pull the St. Valentine's Day massacre, do you think his longevity would have been longer? Uh, And do you think him pulling the trigger on that hit is what ultimately ended his career? Uh, I do. I I think had Al Capone not really assassinated all those guys at once. I mean, one on one hand, it was fucking necessary. He really didn't have another option. He needed to control the bootlegging. He needed to control his turf. Uh, There were people that took shots at his people. He really had no choice but to sort of... uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the right fucking phrase. There's a phrase on the tip of my tongue that I want to use, but he had to, okay, there it is, level the playing field. He had to level the playing field to keep control. But at the same time, doing that really created a fucking problem for him. Uh, It created a problem with Luciano and the commission. It especially created a fucking problem with the police. Uh, So would he have, would the government, would Dewey have gone after him even harder or, or less hard if he hadn't killed those people? Absolutely. I think the government would have been less concerned about him not paying fucking taxes, uh, you know, if he hadn't killed 16 people, whatever the fuck it was. Uh, and, and that's the huge problem. Now, Al Capone doesn't do that. There's a couple of problems. The first thing is he, he's going to have to go to war in a different kind of way. And who knows if he outlasts that or whether he gets New York involved in that. I don't know. Uh, so there's a lot of different things, uh, repercussions that we can kind of, you know, play on. But I think the reality is if he doesn't do it, he's going to lose ground and turf, right? That's number one. Uh, so he does it, which enables him to take over. But at the same time that he does that, then it catches the government's fucking eyes. And then they were like, they had a hard on for Capone. Uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, 
I don't know how much longer his career really honestly would have fucking been because the guy had syphilis, right? So he ended up dying of syphilis complications at a very young age. Uh, so, you know, do I think that he had a could have had a couple of more years run? Absolutely, hundred uh, percent. If he doesn't do that hit, but it was a necessity at that time. And you know, a lot of people don't know this, but Al Capone was bankrupt. He didn't have two dimes to rub together. When he died, he went from making $40 million a year. The mafia put him on a $600 a week stipend after he was done. He died fucking poor. Uh, it was so bad that his wife, May, had to sell the fucking house when he died. I think within a year of his death, she had to sell it because she had no money to live on. So, you know, th there's something to be said for you make $40 million a year. Where the fuck does it go? You know, and then the mob's going to give you $600 a week as a sort of gratuity or a thank you. Like, I think, in my personal opinion, I think Al Capone was worth a lot more fucking money than $600 a fucking week, you know? But I know the mafia was also very concerned with Al Capone because a part of his problem having syphilis was he was a fucking nuts. He was a fucking nut job. He was screaming all kinds of weird shit, and people started to talk that they were afraid Al Capone was going to say too much, and so that's why they shut him down at his compound and wouldn't let him out. His wife was trying to protect his life because Chicago guy said, listen, if this motherfucker goes out and starts spewing shit about murders, we're going to fucking kill him. And so there you go. A lot of people don't talk about that part of it. All right. With these new mob shows and podcasts and vlogging, it seems to be that seemed to be going on. What is your take on the genre now? Is it rebounding? Because I know in the past you said the, the genre was slowly fading out. Is there any mob podcasts that you do listen to? Uh, if you do, which ones, and are they good factually speaking, or or are they all just a collection of people who don't know what the fuck they're talking about? Uh, no, I don't. I really, I think I listen to Gangland Wire. I think that's a good one. I, I listen to bits and pieces about that. They 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 they, they factually uh, know what they're talking about. They get a couple things wrong, but so do I. Like I'm not perfect either. Uh, but but factually speaking, I I think Gangland Wire is like pretty close to the vest about getting the facts out they seem to not understand the politics of it but as far as abc they got that down uh, i've listened to that a couple of times past that i don't listen to anybody else's podcasts on organized crime uh, a lot of the reason is because the majority of people that i have tried listening to uh either read articles fucking verbatim on their show and don't talk about anything fucking enlightening don't know the mob politics if a fly landed on their ass and or their face and wiggled their ass uh they just simply regurgitate every article they read during the week and to me that's like face value i'm not wasting my fucking time i can just take my time plug in the internet and go oh all right i saw the article on jimmy the woman getting killed all right sounds good uh but anybody that just sits there and then asks for donations on top of it uh, they want donations for reading other people's work is bullshit to me. Uh, I think that if you have common sense and a brain to operate a podcast structure, you should at least honor yourself enough to like invest the time to learn and to know what you're talking about. A lot of people don't. Uh, and it's not me being a snob about shit. Uh, there's probably people that do a better job than me. Uh, there are probably people that keep it re uh, keep it real in terms of they don't say fuck you every three seconds like I do. But that's just how I talk in general. Uh, so there, I'm sure there's shows that are better than mine. I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I think in many ways, and oh, my, my listeners are going to love this. I think in many ways, even though I cannot stand those two motherfuckers in South Philadelphia, you have no idea how much I can't stand those fucking miserable cunts, uh, pricks, gremlins. Uh, do they know what they're talking about most days? Yeah, sure. I mean, they report bullshit like everybody else, but do, do they, do they, do I like the idea of them standing there talking to each other like crackheads getting ready to jerk each other off for like a, for money. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I, I, I watch their stuff. I'm not going to lie to you. I have, I have watched their stuff. So what they do isn't bad. I just don't think that they understand the politics and I think they have a narrative and I think they're rats and that's what my problem is with them. Uh, and I don't want to get started on that. Uh, so is the genre falling out? No, I don't think so. I, I think it's kind of rebounding a little bit, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of this is because of COVID. I think a lot of people don't have nothing to do. But in, in just weeks, we, we saw a couple of mob podcasts. It was mine and a couple other people that did theirs. Uh, nobody does what I do. I'm a little different. Then all of a sudden, they started popping up everywhere. And everybody all of a sudden now who had 200 bucks and nothing better to do is all of a sudden talking about the mafia. And they have no fucking idea what they're talking about. Uh, just recently, I listened to a fucking shit show. Uh, I don't like this fucking show. I can't stand it. But 
the mere fact that I kind of take crip notes on it is because this is how fucking stupid it is. So there's this stupid bastard that thinks he thinks he was somebody. He was a fucking nobody. He was a B and E bullshit artist, a jerk off, and a cunt. Sorry, ladies, just gonna say it. The guy's a fucking cunt. This guy had the nerve to fuck. And this is a gangster. He's telling you he's a gangster. He has the nerve to tell people that Rudy Giuliani invented the RICO law. Well, number one, you're a fucking idiot because it was William F. Blakely that designed the RICO law. Then he follows that up with, oh, yeah, it was uh, Rudy Giuliani who fucking uh, uh, read about the RICO law and then he used it to prosecute the commission. Uh, yeah, it, it, he found out about the RICO law because of Joe Bonanno. Well, first of all, you dipshit. No. Rudy Giuliani already knew the RICO law. He just didn't know how to attach it to the five families of organized crime because the law itself attaches you. If I do a crime and I'm with my friend Andrew, all right, and Andrew knew about it, and then Andrew commits a crime, if they can attach us to some sort of criminal conspiracy, we're all going to fucking jail. Rudy Giuliani didn't understand how the fucking commission worked, how it operated. When he read Joe Bonanno's book, Joe Bonanno, A, B, C, D, and E, told him exactly how it worked in his book, the structure, the why, the how, and then Giuliani knew how to attach the law to get them. Now, if Joe Bonanno doesn't write that fucking book, this never happens. So this particular dipshit who can't talk for three fucking seconds on a podcast without licking his lips like a crackhead jerk off, doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. And the funny thing is, you look at this fucking podcast, and it's not even a podcast. I don't know what the fuck it is, a shit show. They don't, none of them know what they're talking about historically. Not a single one of them. And and one of them was in the life loosely. The other one wishes he was. He just likes to make shit up. Uh, they bring in every jerk off off the street who was fucking nothing in that life. And that's my point is you get, and then they charge people on top of it, which is a disgrace. Because you're not getting any value out of that. All you're getting is somebody's opinion who may or may not have done some things in that life. I'm not, I would never take that away from anybody. But consider the fucking source. If they don't know anything about Giuliani or the RICO law, maybe they should just shut the fuck up. That's just my opinion. If you don't understand the law, you don't understand how it works, you don't understand street politics, shut up. Stop pretending to be Sammy Gravano when you never were. And that's my point. That's my point. So the genre isn't really dead. It's just sort of it, things are sparking up left, right, all over the place. But the quality of it, or at least the people presenting it, don't have enough understanding or the bearing to get you from A to B. It, it's not about saying in 19 fucking 62, Joe Bonanno ran and hid. Uh, and then all of a sudden, no, you've got you to gotta tell people what was going on in 19 fucking 62. You have to explain to people. The reason why Joe Bonanno took off, because there's 20 or 30 things that are in between one statement and the next that A, they don't fucking know. B, if they just sat down and did the fucking research, they would know. Think about it. If I was coming to you as a, as a mafia guy who wasn't a rat or even a rat, let's just say a rat for the sake of this, and I told you the same things I'm telling you now. At least you could say, wow, he knows his shit. He might be a piece of shit rap motherfucker, but at least he knows his shit. These guys can't even talk. All, all they want you to do is buy their bullshit. They want to amp up who they were because who they really were and who they're trying to be are two different fucking things. And all you have to do is research. You do the research on that. Trust me. You will come back to me and go, Jesus Christ, you were fucking right. And so it's not really necessarily a matter of the genre being dead. It's just, I don't know where the genre is going. I think you're going to see a lot more podcasts, but the problem is, is that the quality, quality versus quantity, there's a million of them now, the quality, am I the best? No, I'm not going to say that. Do I get shit wrong? Absolutely. But at least I'm honest about it. That's more than I could say for them. Oh boy, rabbit trail galore today. All right. I would like to ask you a wide question here. Let's say for instance, you're not in the life at all. Uh, but you know people in that life and they came to you asking for a favor. Would you do it? Uh, if you knew someone was going to hurt them, would you get involved even though it's not your place or business to protect them or get involved? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, listen, I got a lot of friends. If if somebody came to me that, that allegedly was in this and that and the third and they asked me for a favor or help, I'm helping them. They're my friend. That's what I do. I don't need to ask questions. All right, what do you need? All right, I'll take care of it. Not a problem. Uh as far as uh, 
if somebody was going to try to hurt one of the, my friends, like if I heard whispers, somebody, this, somebody was going to do this to somebody, you better believe I'm going to do whatever I can to protect them. I don't give a fuck about politics. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, a part of that. Uh, so yeah, I would protect my friends a hundred percent. Would they protect me? Maybe in some cases, no, but that, but I'm different than everybody else. Uh, you know, but I would like to think I would, I, I certainly, if it was, if I was, uh, you know, in public with somebody, and somebody tried to start some shit with them, ain't nobody putting a hand on them. <laughs> that ain't happening. Before they get three feet near the guy, I'm going to clock them. I'm going to crack them. And it's over with. But that's what I do for everybody. It just doesn't matter if whether they're a gangster or not a gangster, an alleged guy, a fringe guy, an associated guy. It doesn't matter to me. If you're my friend, it doesn't matter what your title is. I'm, I'm going to help you. I'm going to defend you. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a short break really quick. Uh, obviously, my cell phone's fucking ringing. So the nonsense that got started before this show is obviously still fucking going on. Uh, but we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we are going to answer more of your questions uh, on the Q&A. Stay tuned on Mob Talk Radio. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are answering your questions to the best of our ability today. All right. Uh, so this is my only question. Now, if a boss is incarcerated, uh, I know money gets kicked up. But how and where does the money go? To the family, to the blood family? And why, if a boss is locked up, why not just give him, con- why not just give up control of the family? Is it ego uh, or is it that they just have uh, to still have a say so or what? Um, if a boss is locked up, don't you think he should give up control to make the street men an incentive to not try and pull a power play and to try to not take over the family? Uh, the only thing I can really say is this, uh, look, if you're locked up and you're the boss, right? The money is going to find its way to your family regardless. Some guys use wives to collect it. Some don't, uh, it, it finds its way no matter what to the boss. It's just the way it works. Uh, You know, it's never going to be really a direct thing. Say a guy shows up, hands off an envelope. Sometimes it goes through a few other guys, but it gets in nonetheless. Uh, Some guys use lawyers for that purpose too. Uh, I think, you know, most bosses probably likely have a bit of an ego. I mean, I think you've got to be at at that point. Uh, But just because, you know, you're away on vacation for a while doesn't mean you have to relinquish the reins. Uh, But I think, say, if you're doing 30 years or take Carmine Persico, for example, uh, other than money, what the fuck is the point? Uh, Sometimes that does more damage than good. Uh, Maybe it's ego. And then sometimes maybe someone, you know, uh, you know, someone, uh, you know, put away has a better firm grip on things than, say, somebody on the streets. Uh, And and yeah, it gives ways to power plays and bickering and and politics. So, you know, maybe it's better if somebody hands over to power, sort of like Tony Ducks Corallo did. Uh, but I think, you know, it, it's a title that you earn. Nobody just gives it to you. You earn that shit. Uh, and, and, and some guys just don't want to relinquish power. They're going away for the rest of their lives. This is all they got left. This is all they've ever believed in. So, you know, I get it from a certain perspective, uh, but I'm not in that position. So I don't know how I would feel. But I, I think sometimes, you know, things can run their fucking course. And sometimes, like, especially in the case of Maddie Madonna and Stephen Crea, uh, you know, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but, and in, in that case, it was better. They stepped to the side and get the fuck out of the way, you know, and rather than face retribution and murder and mayhem and all of that. All right. I just finished reading, t- reading the Tommy karate book, the butcher. Uh, did he really have a high pitched squeaky voice? Uh, so I, I got this question, I think last week too, uh, whether he does or he doesn't really doesn't fucking matter. The reality is uh, if that were to be the case, let's say, I bet you nobody tells him that to his face. Uh, you know, Philip Carl- Carlo wrote that book. There are a lot of inaccuracies with that book. He didn't talk to Tommy about writing that book. Uh, so a lot of the things that Philip Carlo has written over his career, you know, he has passed away. Uh, he's no longer alive. Uh, I, he took a lot of liberties with shit that wasn't true. Uh, and, and it is what it is, uh, whether or not Tommy, what kind of voice Tommy has doesn't fucking matter to me, whether it's a loud booming voice or a mini mouse voice, a motherfucker will kill you. Uh, make no bones about it. All right. Are the bosses of family's friends? Uh, 
I mean, nobody else really understands what they what each are thinking. Do they ever pick up the phone, call each other and say, hey, man, happy birthday, happy anniversary. Tell Maria I said hello. Uh, listen, my bosses, my people are, like I said earlier, they're the same as you and me. Uh, they're probably Carlo Gambino is probably not going to pick up the phone and call Vito Genovese. Uh, and say, hey, uh, did you collect 20 dimes from, from this and that? You know, they're not going to talk like that. Uh, who knows? Maybe they sent a card in the mail. Hey, congratulations on Joey getting his first fucking blowjob. I mean, I don't fucking know. Uh, I doubt they're good. they go out of their way to, to discuss anything. Like I've always said, bosses should meet in confessionals at church. That's that's my thing. Uh, because the feds are because the feds trying to wiretap a church. Oh, you want to, especially a Catholic church, that's going to be met with serious fucking outrage. So if I was a boss. I'd meet them in church. Middle of the day in a pew. Make it short and sweet. Listen, Joey Bags has got to go. You okay with that? Uh-huh. Yep. God bless. Have a nice day and walk out. Uh, why nobody does that? Uh, or meets in a graveyard in the middle of the fucking night. Why not do that? Uh, these are all things that I would do uh, to avoid being watched and listened to. That's just me. Okay, stick with me on the, here on this long question. Currently, I am reading The Quiet Don about Russell Buffalino. Is it true that when Castro took over Cuba on January 1st in 1959, Buffalino was in Cuba along with Meyer Lansky and both had to flee the island for safety? And that also Russell Buffalino had about a million dollars stashed in Cuba that he was never able to retrieve. Uh, actually, yes. Everything that you are saying is is 100% accurate. Uh, but all entailed, it's been said that Meyer Lansky lost over $400 million because of Fidel Castro. Uh, they all lost a ton of fucking money. I mean, a lot of money that Batista allowed the mob guys to put into his banks were raided by Fidel Castro. He stole all the fucking money. So he empties the banks. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. They took it in the ass big time financially, uh, which is why they backed John F. Kennedy so fucking hard, because he had promised he would get rid of fucking Castro and allow them to go back to make him money. That's what they wanted. That's what the U.S. government wanted. It didn't work out. And we kind of know the results of that. Uh, I've always wondered how Tommy Patera considers his current predicament does he claim he's innocent and the feds made up a case or he's guilty and eh, just doing my time no complaints that's life or maybe that bastard frank ganji lied made up a bunch of stuff Gotti, for example claimed everybody lied and he was screwed even though he was an unapologetic gangster uh listen i can't speak for tommy patera but the one thing that i can say is this in any case right or wrong uh there's myths true myth true mistruths excuse me uh, if everybody was completely innocent, they wouldn't be in jail or under indictment to begin with, right? So I, I think where the line often strays is the government's assertion of events or the idea of events. Uh, when they can suggest and, and, and pay a rat to back up their claims, which is why informants always admit to tailoring their testimony to back up the Fed's claims. And I said that earlier. Uh, it makes the case so much more palatable. Uh, I don't I don't think Tommy Patera has ever sat back uh, and said, oh, I never did nothing wrong, uh, but I, I think he would take umbrance with some of the things that Frank Ganji has said. Uh, just just as Frank Ganji would take umbrance with being put in that situation to begin with. Uh, so it goes both ways there in, in that particular uh, scenario. Uh, so it's truly a wash at the end of the fucking day. And it becomes, you know, which side is more believable when the feds say this guy's a fucking monster and then they back it up with the words of a rat. They add big words like racketeering and extortion. What do you expect a jury to believe? Uh, I always thought that they should teach a jury what organized crime was. They should have to take a fucking organized crime fucking course before they could be on a fucking jury of a mob fucking trial. Uh, you know, uh, because listen, if, they, if that were to happen, they would grasp the ins and outs of organized crime. Maybe, maybe that would be a little bit too prejudicial. Uh, but at least they aren't going off some sort of idea from watching movies in the fucking Sopranos, for Christ's sakes. I mean, look, Gotti never apologized for who he was, nor the amount of people that went down because of him. Uh, it's one thing to be unapologetic. It's another to bury those people around you that you called friends. So it goes all different directions, but it always goes both ways. Guys do what they do, but it's not always as bad as it seems on paper. Stephen Crea, Stephen Crea for example... Uh, the feds alleged he ordered a hit or Greenwood a hit, yet the testimony in that case and the facts showed that Matty Madonna was pissed off over being told to fuck off after Michael Meldish refused to pay him back. So if Madonna hit him because of it, how does Korea fall into that target zone? And that's because under Rico, 
if you're shown to have a criminal alliance or a conspiracy or a line drawn in the fucking sand in the shape of a big federal government dick, you're all going to get charged with the same fucking crime. So, you know, on its heels, I, you know, personally, I think Rico should be fucking outlawed. Uh, but no, I, I don't think Tommy like sits back and, and, you know, bemoans everything that he's innocent. Uh, I don't think Tommy would tell you that either, but I think that they allege some shit that maybe Tommy didn't do. All right. Hey, Jeff, thanks for answering my questions. As always, was there any significant sign for the chandler? Oh, the chandelier being left on Roy DeMeo's body. Uh, was that a message his killers were sending? Uh, I am sure just the fact they killed a guy like that was a message enough. Uh, Okay, uh, you're uh, okay. Have a blessed day. All right. Uh, no, they 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 simply killed him and, and, and just threw shit over top of him. I mean, if you think about it, why even do that? Uh, you know, they cut the hands off of Sonny Black, and the reason why they cut the hands off Sonny Black is because he shook hands with Tony Brasco. Antonio Caponegro was found with money shoved in his ass and mouth, which was a sign that he was greedy uh, and wanted to take over a crime family. Uh, some guys have had their tongues removed for talking. Some guys have had their tongues cut out and put in their ass because they talked. Uh, you know, it just depends. But a chandelier, I don't know. Maybe Roy De, Roy DeMeo loved Liberace. Uh, and, and Anthony and Nino confused chandelier with candelabra. How the fuck should I know? Uh, but no, I don't think it was really much of anything. I think it was just the fact that eh, fuck it, throw it on him. Who gives a fuck? He's dead. That's probably it. All right. Hello, sir. Does the Los Angeles Mafia still exist? In part, yes. But from what I understand, the traditional Los Angeles family is pretty much defunct for the most part. Uh, but that would have uh, but they also have a contingent of the Gambinos out that way. And I heard they were operating out of Riverside and Orange County mainly these days. Uh, look, the days of Dragna and Caruso are over. Uh, but there's so much organized crime going on in L.A. I mean, we're not talking Italians. I mean, you know, the Russians, uh, La M.A., MS-13, I, just the list of Crips, the Bloods, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, so I don't think the mob, you know, nearly is, is really anything out there as far as to, to be trifled with. I think all these other gangs are a lot more powerful than them. All right, is Dominic Montiglio still alive or do you think he might have passed? Uh, from what I heard from somebody that lives in Gravesend, they saw him. Uh, he's apparently alive, but he was pretty sick. I, I think somebody said that he had been in and out of the VA hospital uh, in New York for, for some kind of fucking problem. So the last I heard, and this was like a month ago, uh, he was still living in Gravesend and was alive. So I don't know. I don't talk to him, so I couldn't tell you. All right. Was Kansas City at an equal level of power relative to the outfit in Chicago, or was it more of a subsidiary family? Uh, is there still a family in Kansas City after the death of the Savellas? Uh, I don't think that they were equal to Chicago. I mean, let's be honest, uh, but they did wield power. Uh, and yes, they are still active. Uh, they do have some guys there, uh, but they don't have, I think it went from something like, you know, back in the fucking 60s, like 100, you know, not 100, maybe 100 guys total, but probably more like 45 to 50. Uh, and from what I understand now, they only have 15 main guys. Obviously, that number probably is not going to fucking be accurate. But uh, from what I understand and what's been alleged, at least from law enforcement, uh, that John Sciartino is the boss and took over after Tony Savello went away. Uh, so the numbers are low. Uh, they're not what they once were, but there still is a remnant there. All right. Who the hell was Benny Squince Lombardo? I'm curious on his power, wealth, and influence, but being a Genovese boss makes you an absolute fucking ghost. So is there, so there's probably not a lot on him, but who was he as a person? Was he an earner? Whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, look, Benny Squince, Philip Benny Squince Lombardo was actually a Genovese boss from the 60s until the early 80s. Uh, he had a 20 year run. Uh, he got his credibility uh, from being in the 116th Street crew under Trigger Mike Coppola. Uh, you know, he only did one prison stint for narcotics trafficking. I mean, and that's kind of rare for a lot of these guys. So when Vito Genovese goes away, he installed a ruling panel, which was Michael Miranda, Jerry Catania, and Tommy Aboli. Excuse me. Uh, and Joe Valachi testified under a, sub, a Senate subcommittee hearing uh, that Lombardo uh, was also on that panel as well. Uh, and that might be pretty close to the truth, believe it or not, because Lombardo ends up sort of becoming boss. There are two different sides to the story, however, because it's alleged that Anthony Strawo uh, was actually whacked to get rid of him as acting boss. And right after that, Tommy Eboli, uh, 
is given the title, but Carlo Gambino has Tommy Eboli murdered so that he could get Frank Funzi Thierry in as their boss. But according to Vincent Cafaro, uh, Lombardo was actually the boss and was using Funzi Thierry and Tommy Eboli as fronts to conceal his power. Uh, he was alleged to have been the boss from 1968 till about 1981 and then stepped down and handed the reins over to Vinny the Chin Gigante. Uh, you know, so it wasn't really until the 1960s that anybody knew who the fuck Benny Squints was. Nobody knew because he was sort of in the shadows. Uh, he, he stuck to himself uh, and just stay out of the fucking way. Um, you know, and it really honestly, truly wasn't until 1960s when uh, FBI wiretaps. Now, here's the thing about the wiretaps that I need to explain. They were not allowed to even do that until like the 60s. But the thing is, they couldn't use those tapes in a court of law. So what they had to do is write them down and say, well, this is what we heard. Nowadays, forget it. They could play the fucking audio tapes like and listen to a fucking fly fucking Egypt uh, if they wanted to. Uh, but but Lombardo was a powerful guy. You know, he was a shadow figure and, and he didn't expose himself to anybody in terms of talking. I mean, he was low key and insanely powerful. And like I said, he came up under Trigger Mike. Uh, was his bodyguard and driver, and he was a nasty, tough guy. He collected money for Coppola and was a proficient killer, uh, and he was an earner. He was a major narcotics trafficker, uh, probably one of the biggest traffickers in the 1950s alone. Uh, but this is a guy who, for 60 years, only took one pinch. Uh, it wasn't really even known to the FBI for a long time. It wasn't until the 80s, after he had pretty much almost stepped down, that they sort of figure out how 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 powerful he was uh so yeah he was a killer and an earner uh for certain uh all right uh how many okay how many guys on the sopranos were actually gangsters were any made and if so uh were they allowed to act in a tv series without repercussions if any obviously we know that tony sirico uh, was was somebody that came up in the colombo crime family he had a long checkered past uh, and, and a lot of people would consider him probably an associate with the Colombo crime family, but not a made guy. Uh, Anthony Borghese, who goes by the acting name of Tony Darrow, uh, who was on The Sopranos. He played Larry Barisi, uh, and he was also in Goodfellas. He was convicted of extortion on behalf of the uh, Gambino crime family. He was not a made guy. Uh, I am going to totally mispronounce his fucking last name. Uh, Michael Squicciarini. Uh, he was in a lot of different mob movies in the early, late 80s, 90s. He was on The Sopranos. He played a guy by the name of Big Frank Cipollina uh, in the second season of The Sopranos. And he was a former fucking collector for the Cavalcante crime family. Uh, he was also a hitman uh, in real life. In 2002, he was implicated in a gangland execution that took place 10 years prior. And according to documents filed by the Manhattan District Attorney, uh, Swickerini and others lured a rival drug dealer named Ralphie Hernandez into a Brooklyn nightclub owned by DeCavalcante Capo, Joe Pitts Canigliaro. Canigliaro, who was wheelchair bound due to a paralyzing wound sustained in a prior shootout, uh, pulled a gun on Hernandez and shot him in the forehead. Uh, the Capo was then wheeled over to the dying drug dealer, who he shot three more times in the fucking head. Canigliaro's henchman rolled Hernandez's body up in a carpet, dumped it in an abandoned lot nearby, and returned to clean the blood-stained nightclub floor. Uh, one of these men's, uh, one of the men was uh, Squickerini. Uh, his exact role, they're not sure of, but he was involved, at least according to law enforcement. Uh, you know, and so, uh, there you go. And, and how he even got caught was because somebody fucking watching The Sopranos saw him. So it's sort of like the, 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 the fucking Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa go on fucking Jenny Jones or whatever, and, and fucking Heidel's mother sees them and recognizes them. Sort of the same sort of uh, periphery here. All right. Uh, the one Sicilian mafia member that has always been a mystery to me is Tommaso Buscetta. What was his deal? He lived in Italy, the U.S., Brazil, and even Canada. Was he on the run? Did other families fear him? Well, of course he was on the run because he was a fucking rat. Uh, there is a Netflix doc. This, this is the best thing that I can do for the person that asked this fucking question. There is a Netflix documentary called Our Father, the Godfather, which is ex all about uh, Tommaso Buscetta. But if you don't understand Sicilian dialect, you need to go in and put the captions. Otherwise, you're going to get fucking lost. But that is the best way for me to explain that without sitting here for the next fucking 5,000 years. All right, what do you think Maddie Madonna's legacy will be? 
Uh, and is this an end of the era for the Lucchese crime family? Uh, we sort of have to go back to what the, you know, at least the feds alleged happened a while back. It's been alleged that Vicka Musso uh, has been running the Lucchese's from the can since 1993. And he put it out that Madonna and Korea needed to step down and out of the way. Otherwise, he was going to kill them both. So back in 2017, Amuso sends a letter naming Mikey DeSantis, the new act and boss, which was essentially uh, stripping Madonna and Korea of any leadership whatsoever. Uh, it was also pushing the leadership from the Bronx back to Brooklyn. Uh, both Madonna and Korea had to step aside or Amuso was, was going to push the nuke button and kill the entire crew. That's just what he was going to do. Uh, I, I think that that sort of speaks volumes for both of them, not to disparage either one of them, because I'm not doing that. But Madonna had a history of getting arrested a lot. Uh, and, to the, and, and in this day and age, the, you know, they want younger leadership. They want less attention, less problems. And I personally think moving a younger acting boss and moving it back to Brooklyn is the best way to go. Because New Rochelle and the Bronx are filled with nothing but mob guys. Uh, and, of course, you, know, you want to see guys come back to Brooklyn. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it's better to, to, to not be seen or heard. Uh, so I think the fact that Amuso made that decision leaves sort of an asterisk next to Maddie Madonna. Uh, what 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 could have been and in, in, in things like that. Um, listen, Madonna was not a soft guy, but but he outlived his usefulness, and and you know it's unfortunate that the way that, that all kind of went down. And, and you know, obviously, he recently just got life in prison, uh, and he's going to die there, unfortunately. And Stephen Korea is probably going to be uh, getting the same fucking sentence. Uh, I, so. Madonna's legacy is going to be he was a tough guy. He was a moneymaker and earner. But, you know, not everybody that's successful uh, gets away with it. All right. All right. Now we know how high Carlo Gambino ranks among those whose visionary influence has had radically seminal permeancy. So two questions. Who influenced him? Uh, that's okay. So this is the first question. So I, uh, to be, I, eh, um, to be honest with you, I would imagine his cousins, the Castellanos, did. Uh, I, I'm sure because he didn't come to the U.S. until he was 19. And by the time he even comes to the United States through Norfolk, Virginia, uh, you know, he was already a, a mob hitman. He was a made guy. Uh, and, and so I'm sure that he had that sort of instilled in him from Italy. Uh, he ends up going to work for uh, Salvatore Di Aquila. Uh, you know, Joe Massaria, Philip Mongano, Vincent Mongano, Albert Anastasia. So, I mean, I'm sure he takes uh, bits and pieces from everybody. Uh, and look, by his mid-20s, he was a feared mob guy already with a serious reputation. So, you know, I would assume that he brings some of it with him from his, his experiences in Sicily, and then he comes to New York, uh, and he picks up a little bit more. Uh, the second part of his question, uh, this is one of my favorite fans, believe it or not. All right, if you could ask him one question about what he did and how he did it, the silent smiles and knowing nods and the permeated low profile, the total understanding of fear versus love, uh, what would your question be? My question to him would be very simple. How hard was it triple and quadruple dealing on people and not fearing a single fucking retributive person? Because to me, that speaks volumes. So you're going to make a decision. You're going to fuck four different guys six ways from fucking Sunday, and you're not going to fear a single one of them. That's fucking power, my friend. And that's what I want to know what it feels like, A, to have that power, and how the fuck do you do that and go to sleep at night not worrying about a fucking thing? Looking out the window going, eh, fuck them, you know? <laughs> All right, hypothetical question here. If New York City, there was an all-out war between the Irish, the Jews, the Russians, the Greeks, and the Albanians, who would come out on top? Uh, in this situation, Italy remains completely neutral and doesn't get involved. You want to know who wins? The fucking cops. <laughs> Look, I can't answer this because anybody can shoot anybody. Uh, you know, the cops are going to win in that. The cops are going to win. Uh, the cops are going to win. There you go. All right. Who was the informant that led the f let the feds know about the commission meeting where the bosses were photographed, leaving shown in that documentary, Fear City? Greg Scarpa was the guy. Greg Scarpa was the rat in that case. All right. Have you seen the movie Vault? And what did you think of it? Was it an accurate portrayal to your knowledge? Uh, it was... It was bad. Yeah, I mean, it was really bad. Uh, it wasn't very accurate. I just want to leave that right there. I, I've talked about the vault a million times. All right. Uh, did Roy DeMeo ever have any relation with Carl Gambino, or was DeMeo introduced to the family by Gaggi after uh, Gambino's reign? No, DeMeo came up through through Nino, 
uh, not Gambino. Uh, Roy was already involved in car theft and narcotics by 1972. Uh, and the DeMeo crew had already formed before Gambino died in 1976. So, I mean, I would assume and imagine that Carlo knew of Roy DeMeo. Uh, probably not about the narcotics, uh, because I don't think he would have been receptive to what Roy DeMeo was up to. Uh, you know, Gambino still would have taken his kickback, but I just don't think he would have liked it. Uh, they began their killing rampage prior to Carlo Gambino dying. In fact, after DeMeo henchman Chris Rosenberg killed the two Colombians in 1978, which led to the Colombians wanting to kill the entire crew as a, res- you know, as a result of all of that, uh, and then Roy wax a vacuum cleaner salesman out of fucking fear. They better be glad that Carlo Gambino was dead because he would have killed every single fucking one of them, including Nino, uh, for all of that nonsense. Uh, so there you go. All right, with Michael France, or excuse me, with France, Sonny Francis now passed away. Who is the oldest living made guy in the U.S.? How the fuck would I know that? <laughs> you think I got a Rolodex of fucking septuagenarian gangsters? Uh, well, uh, let's see. Uh, Vito the Cock just turned 82. Maybe he's... Nope, 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 nope. Uh, here's here's Jimmy the, the, the Cock Clamp. Nope, he's 85. So he's, uh, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Couldn't tell you. Uh, probably uh, Frankie Lacasio uh, is up there in age, so maybe him. All right, we're John Holmes, the porn star, and Eddie Nash connected men, hence their involvement in the Wonderland murders of 1981. Okay, so this topic is way, 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 way too big for me to discuss here, and I don't have time to get into the ABC of all of this uh, because it's just there's movies being made about this shit. Uh, But uh, what I will tell you this is Eddie Nash, uh, his house gets robbed. He was sort of a drug dealer. He was of Palestinian descent. His real name was Adele Narasawa. Uh, To my knowledge, he was not a mobster. He was a drug dealer. Uh, It's that basic. Uh, So I would imagine his contacts likely would have been mainly in the narcotics industry. Uh, Presumably, uh, Nash had been connected to the mafia. Uh, You know, I'm sure he had some some connections to somebody uh, somewhere. Uh, You know, uh, coke traffickers, maybe some fringe mob guys. Uh, But if he did, why didn't he have John Holmes killed? And the reason why I say that to you uh, is because he suspected that John Holmes was involved in giving the, the, the location of the house, what was going on in the house, uh, and he was the culprit or the setup guy in that invasion. Uh, needless to say, it's worth noting that Nash didn't take that shit sitting down either, uh, as those responsible for doing that were found bludgeoned to death. Uh, you know, uh, Billy Deverall, uh, the Joy Miller, I think Barbara Richardson, uh, and Ron uh, Linus, I think his name was. Uh, they were all found bludgeoned to death. So at the end of the day, Nazarella gets his due. Uh, but were they like in deep with the mafia? No, I don't think so. I really don't. Uh, ask Ori Spato, since he was the boss of fucking L.A., he would know, right? Fuck out of here. All right, you must get fed up with answering the same questions over and over. So what's the most common question you get asked on the show that would bother you? Uh, who would win in a fight? Uh, who would kill who uh, if this faction fought that faction? Those are all things that I get tired of answering. I mean, it was fun at first, but it, it, in reality, at the end of the day, just, you know, uh, maybe people just want to hear my opinion and I get it. But it's just those kind of questions. Any gaudy question at this point, I, I just can't fucking stomach. Uh, you know, we, we have to talk about uh, other things and, and no disrespect to to John Gotti Sr. whatsoever. Uh, but you know, there's more to the mafia than a guy who had the f- a five year run. Uh, it was a disaster for the Gambino crime family. I mean, that's just reality. Anybody that tells you any different is lying to you. Uh, I have said positive things about John Gotti senior. I have said negative things because I call it down the middle. Uh, I guess it just depends on which dipshits listening to my show and wants to take, you know, a shot at me for thinking I always say this or that. Fuck them all. I don't care. All right, was Murder, Inc. really a team of assassins on call, ready for hits, or was this just a regular mob guys taking on contracts? Uh, I want a street point of view of Murder, Inc., because all I know is what the media puts out. Well, obviously, you're only going to know typically what the, what, what the media puts out, but it was designed so that all of the mafia, uh, the Jewish mobsters, the, the, the Italian mobsters, the Irish mobsters, all the organized crime had a squad of guys that could go and take care of business if they needed something done. 
Uh, Lance King Luciano agreed that the Jewish mafia and the Italian mafia should have equal rights to that group, and they didn't want a Jewish guy overseeing the full entire group or a single Italian looking over that group. So what they did was they got a Jewish guy, a Louis Lepke Buckhalter, and then they got Albert Anastasia, and so now everybody's happy because they feel like they have representative in the group. Uh, they handled problems. They handled witnesses. They handled everything. They are estimated to have killed over a thousand people during their reign. So they were no fucking joke and they were definitely a team of assassins. All right. I saw that Carlo Gambino was arrested on armed robbery charges. He faked a heart attack. Uh, he faked a heart attack or heart trouble to delay and they tried to deport him. Uh, did he do a deal to pay officials a thousand dollars a month for life to stay? Uh, in 1970, he was indicted in charges of conspiracy to hijack an armored car carrying three million dollars. He was arrested on March 23rd of 1970. He was released on 75k bond uh, and was never brought to trial actually because of his health. Uh, then he actually did suffer a heart attack, which is why the deportation never happened. But I'm sure that at some point money was put in the right pockets. I don't know the deal. I've heard different numbers before. I obviously wasn't there. Uh, and people make up all kinds of shit. Uh, but I've heard that before, that, that, that he was paying some people high up in the government money every month or, you know, for the rest of their life. Uh, would I believe it? Sure, why not? He had a ton of money. Why not do it? Uh, you know, what what evidence they might have had on Carlo to arrest him for, for, for robbery to begin with probably had to do with somebody talking. I, I would almost guarantee you that. All right. Any info on Eddie Costello, brother of Frank Costello, uh, whether or not he went into the business with Frank or went with it. To my knowledge, he was he was pretty much clean for the most part. There, there's not a lot known about his brother, uh, you know, but Frank Costello, you know, he never killed nobody. A lot of people think that Frank Costello made his bones. He, Frank Costello never killed nobody. Uh, it was his power at earning in politics that, that got him in. All right. Uh what are some other mob mental relationships similar to Gotti and Della Croce? Uh, DeMeo and Gaggi, Gravano and, and Tato uh, Ariello, uh, Montiglio and Gaggi, uh, and the list just goes on and on and on. All right. Would you ever consider opening up a cigar lounge or a restaurant in Philadelphia? Uh, no, I don't even like cigar lounges. I think people think I do. Uh, I never really have. You know, while I have friends that own them, you know, I just go to support them and talk shit, you know, see what they're doing. Uh, I don't like the arrogance of those places. And I'm not saying people in there are arrogant, but there's always three or fucking four assholes that think they're going to be politicians uh, that, that, that talk like there's something and they're fucking nothing. They're garbage pails. And it just drives me nuts, uh, especially here in New York. Uh, they act fucking righteous and, and they, you know, they think they can solve all the world's political problems. And it's, you know, to me, I don't want to sit there talking about this shit. Let's talk about the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, let's talk sports. Let's talk about how's your kids? How's your wife? How's your family? How you doing? You need anything? That's what I would rather do. Uh, I would rather sit at a park, believe it or not, beating off the pigeons, coo, coo, cooing, than to sit in a fucking cigar lounge all goddamn day. Uh, most of those places are pretentious. Uh, I consider myself a blue collar guy. Uh, look, I can sit with a murderer, a thief, an iron worker and have normal conversations. I could sit in social clubs all goddamn day long. But I have no desire open to, to open a place in Philadelphia at all. Uh, you know, nor does the restaurant stuff interest me either because I worked in restaurants when I was a little kid. It's ball breaking work. It's back breaking work. And I don't need that fucking stress. However, I am opening something up here in New York. So let the let the fucking the hate monsters go nuts with that. Oh, what's it going to open? What's it going to open? Uh, I, I am opening a place up in Queens. I'm not going to tell you what it is, though. It's not a restaurant. No, it's not a restaurant. So we're just going to leave that there. All right, Jeff, we've all heard stories about huge contracts on rats, half a million on Pistone or Henry Hill. I've also heard mob guys would rather whack the hitmen than pay them. What's the biggest contract for a hit you've ever heard was actually paid out? Uh, believe it or not, I don't think I've ever overheard a conversation between two guys talking about, you know, oh, I paid him 60 grand. He whacked this motherfucker. I've never, I, you know, you don't hear that stuff on the streets. Uh, you know, with certain guys, but, but I really, you know, with certain guys, you know, they might, they might, ah, uh, well, you know, I heard, but I'm not going to repeat that stuff. Uh, I, I may mo know more than I'm admitting, but I, I just, um, I don't put business out there like that. But I heard, however, that Tom, the cat offered his pal, Johnny, the cat $50,000 to whack Jerry, the fucking mouse. And it was paid in full and handled. So there you go. 
All right, if Chris Rosenberg was Chris, insert Italian name, a made member, would he still be hit for the Cuban situation? Uh, so Chris Rosenberg was Jewish by uh, heritage or lineage, uh, was obviously not a made guy, but if we pretend that his real name was DeMeo, uh, he would have been killed either way uh, because the heat that that brought was way too fucking much. Just the heat alone uh, would cause so many fucking problems uh, that a mob family would have had no particular choice but to kill that guy. Uh, risk 100 lives for one? No fucking way. All right, Jeff, I know everybody kept, kicks up money to the top, but is there a certain amount per week they have to kick up that is mandatory? If so, what happens when said account or amount is not kicked up? Uh, and what would stop a guy from lying about the amount he earns? Uh, nothing's going to stop you from lying unless you're involved with three or four other guys and they know what the real amount is and they ratchet out to your fucking captain. <laughs> That's the only way they're going to find out. Uh, everybody has a different kind of way that they do this. Uh, you know, listen, if I loan somebody money and we're just talking you now example here, uh, if I loan money to anybody, it's two weeks. I want my first payment, then it reverts back to a week. Uh, it's different when, when you're a captain collecting because, you know, you get a piece of everything that's going on that's inside your crew, which then gets kicked up to your boss. Uh, you know, of course, guys are going to lie about what they get. Uh, they all do. Everybody wants to make money, you know. So, I mean, if you're kicking up 500 bucks, who gives a fuck? But if you're kicking up 10,000, you know, then, you know, you start to feel a little bitchy about some things. Uh, in some places, I heard it's 10 percent. Other places, it's 12 percent. Uh, I think it just depends on how greedy the boss is, uh, how much money is actually coming in. Because if the crime family is not making a ton of money, then they want every nickel and fucking dime. Just depends. Uh, hi, Jeff. Great show. I love listening to your show from Nottingham in the United Kingdom. Do you have any opinion on the Genovese's being behind the Amityville murders? As I have heard that the DeFeos were connected through Genovese Captain Peter DeFeo. Uh, they weren't behind it. People always try to connect the mafia in some some sort of way to that, but it's simply not the case. Uh, anytime you have a conspiracy, a weird event, uh, people are going to speculate. In this particular case, you mentioned the Italian name, and, and that's what you're going to get. Uh, Ron DeFeo, you know, blamed Louis Fellini, uh, but DeFeo kept changing his story every 10 seconds. He just couldn't keep the narrative going. Uh, it was DeFeo's way of not accepting responsibility for what he fucking did. Uh, the police even went as far as to check out Fellini. And he wasn't even in the state when this happened. Uh, when DeFeo was told that, then he admits to doing the murders himself. So I think what boggles people uh, is that he whacked his whole entire family. People have a hard time being resolute with that. Uh, and it's so different from what normal people do. Like everybody understands if a guy goes into a bank and kills somebody, people just can't wrap their fucking minds around a guy coming home and saying, I've had enough of these fucking people. I'm killing every motherfucking one of them. Now, it's hard for people to, to <laughs> I don't know why I find that so fucking amusing, but, you know, I've heard one too many coughs, Donna. You're going and so is Pop and the rest of them, you fucks. Uh, you know, people have a hard time wrapping their mind around a situation like that. Uh, and it's also been said over the years that DeFeo was schizophrenic, uh, but more importantly, he thought he could get money out of the deal. So that might explain it, but I, I don't think so. All right. Uh, Cosa Nostra planted all the seeds and positioned themselves to take over Cuba. Uh, had Castro and Che Guevara not been successful in 1959, what do you, with your knowledge of this genre, think Cuba would have become under mob control? Uh, I'm trying not to act like Ric Flair. Just imagine Ric Flair saying this, uh, freewheeling, high-flying, destination gambling mecca. That's exactly what it would have become. Uh, I also think the Cuban citizens would have been uh, you know, a lot less fucked uh, than they were under Castro. I think Cuban people would have had money. I think they would have had fucking health care. Uh, they would have become a bigger part of the United States. I, I don't think the Cuban citizens uh, would be in such horrid conditions like they are now. Uh, you know, Castro was fucking atrocious for Cuban people. Uh, you know, it would have been like Monte Carlo in a sense, but it would have been a place like Vegas, like in the Caribbean. Uh, I think the, the mob would have controlled everything. I think it would have been a lot safer and a lot more profitable and, and a lot more hospitable than it is now. Uh, but would the U.S. government have tolerated that? That becomes the question, because then does the government want their kickback? And if the government doesn't get their fucking kickback, then are they going to exploit the cause and, and, and go after the mob? You know, it's just a lot of different things you can play with there. All right. Was Richard Kuklinski 
poisoned by the mob while in prison in New Jersey? And if so, why? Uh, a lot of people have said that, you know, Gravano poisoned him to keep his mouth shut. But why would Gravano waste time? He didn't even know who fucking uh, Richard Kuklinski was. Richard Kuklinski was not a mobster. He didn't work for the mafia. The only interaction that he had with the mafia was because he had dealings with Roy DeMeo after Roy DeMeo shook him the fuck down over the porn. Roy DeMeo shook the guy down. Uh, people continue to keep saying Richard Kuklinski was a gangster. He wasn't a gangster. He's a fucking serial killer. There's a big difference. Uh, he definitely wasn't a mobster. And, I, you know, did somebody poison, poison fucking Kuklinski? Maybe, but there would have been a list of 100 fucking people that wanted him dead. Just, I don't, I don't think it was the mafia. Because the mafia, you know, th- why are they going to waste time poisoning him? Just bludgeon the guy to death. Look, they did Whitey Bulger, for Christ's sakes. All right, if you could make your mafia dream team from any era, who would it be? Uh, starting with the boss, the consigliere, the underboss, and let's say three captains and five soldiers. Ugh. Wow, you're really going to put me in this position. You know, I got friends who might not like what's about to come out of my mouth. So I'm going to send you to hospital, Bill, when they come after me. Uh, as far as uh, uh, a boss, Vinny de Cingigante, uh underboss, Ray Patriarca, consigliere would probably be Frank Costello. Captains would be Tommy Patera, uh, Russell Buffalino, uh, Tony Salerno, uh, my five soldiers, Albert Anastasia, Dutch Schultz, uh, Joey DeClaude Lombardo, Anthony Mira, and Tommy Agro. There you go. I got a fucking certifiable family of nut jobs. (laughs) Oh, geez. At some point in the future, do you see yourself paying the extra fee involved for the leadership skills that Michael Francis sells? What leadership? Uh, What leadership? The guy guy fucking ratted. Uh, now he now he seems to make shit up as he goes along. He's using the Jesus curtain to hide money and bezel. Let's let's get real. Uh, you have a better chance of getting a blowjob from a rabbit fucking raccoon high on angel dust and have it feel feel good than get an ounce of truth out of that Dracula looking blowjob fuck. There you go. That answer that. All right, did all African-American and Latino gangsters in New York kick up to the Italians, or were they left alone because of the heat that they drew? It depends on the era. Uh, Truly, truly, truly depends on uh, the era. Uh, In the early days, they had no choice, but oftentimes, you know, African-Americans and Italian, like Italians, they would handle their own areas, like Bumpy Johnson handles his own turf, uh, Stephanie St. Clair handled her own numbers racket and they often you know like i said they often handle their own problems their own issues uh the only time that the italians really really took a cut was when drugs came uh you know because when that becomes the monetary supplement that's what they're going to do uh nikki barnes frank lucas uh couldn't do shit without the mafia sort of helping them and taking their cut so there you go uh who are the other bosses in the genovese crime family before the chin but after Vito genovese uh, so it would have been, uh, I hope I don't fuck this up, Genovese to Costello, back to Genovese, then to Anthony Strollo, Tommy Eboli, uh, Benny Squint Lombardo to Vinny the Chin. So there you go. That's how that happened. And there may be one or two guys in between. I, I don't count guys who are acting on a panel. Uh, all right. So how big of a p- player was Gerard I met? Uh, we met in New England. He's huge, and I'm working on a show, so stand by on that. He was smart, cunning, dangerous guy. Uh, smart, real smart guy, uh, well-liked guy, but uh, just stay tuned for that. All right. Jeff, do you know a guy that goes by the name of Joey Rock? His channel on Facebook is called Mob Facts. What is his deal? Is he as good as you uh, about the stuff on the mob? Just curious. Uh, I, I, do I know him, like hang out with him? No. Have I talked to him several times? Yeah, absolutely. He's a good guy, uh, knowledgeable guy. Uh, I have to be honest with you. I didn't know he had a Facebook channel. I haven't been on it. Uh, is he as good as me? You know, to me, some people are better than me. Some people aren't. Uh, I think that at one point he was talking about doing a podcast. I think he should. Uh, I think, you know, he's limiting himself by posting, you know, photos with just facts, but that's cool. I mean, at least he gets the shit right. He, he, uh, in the conversations that I have had with him, uh, he's knowledgeable. He's not a dumbass uh, whatsoever. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to go into to, to how we met and stuff like that, but uh, you know, hey, I, I look forward to anybody that tries to do what I do and what everybody else is doing. Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't compare myself to anybody. I never have. I never will. All right. Who is the current Colombo boss? 
Wow. Are you... D- All right, Andrew Russo allegedly is the acting, but I hear that Teddy Purse goes the head, okay? So there you go. Thanks for getting me clipped. (laughs) Uh, It is said that Gaspipe ordered the mafia cops to hit Eddie Wino for putting the hit on him, but I thought it was Angelo Ruggiero that went after Gaspipe, and that's why he was shelved. Or could it have been captain-to-captain thing because wasn't Angelo Ruggiero made a captain when Gotti took over? Was it Wino had the relationship with Jimmy Heidel? Okay, here we go. Let me break this down. First of all, Angelo Ruggiero tried to whack gas pipe Casso over a drug deal, okay? As a result, gas pipe wanted everybody dead. Uh, Frankie DeChico and Eddie Lino. That's exactly why they were killed. Eddie Lino was whacked because he was a captain and they wanted to take out everybody around Gotti and that's just the way that that worked. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it, a lot of this was because Angelo, Angelo tried to subcontract Jimmy Heidel out. Jimmy Heidel fired and fucking missed. Then they had a bigger problem because Jimmy Heidel's uncle was Danny Marino. And I don't want to go any further than that with that certain fact, because that's going to get into an area that is going to create not a problem for me, but it, but then it's going to lead to another subject. And I don't want to talk about that. You're going to have to read about that in my book. Uh, but, but uh, a lot of that was gas pipe retaliating because he wanted to get anybody he could, if he couldn't get, he wanted Ruggiero fucking dead. That's he was, I bet you he's still, was he, is he, where is he? Florence or ADX? Now I bet you he's still muttering to himself that fat fuck. I should have killed him. That's how pissed gas pipe was. All right. Could you do a biography on Don Vito Cachafero, uh, on the new platform, uh, especially his relationship with the young Don Carlo Gambino? Uh, yes, absolutely. I've talked about Kesha Farrell before. Uh, you'd have to check over on YouTube at the list of shows. Uh, but yes, I will definitely do that. All right. Is Catherine Narducci related to Phil Narducci? Nope. She's from New York. Phil is from Philly. Uh, and believe it or not, Catherine Narducci's father, uh, was a mob guy who actually was killed, was murdered. So, uh, Catherine Narducci, who is a fantastic actress, uh, you know, has talked a little bit about that before. Uh, and so there you go. No relation. All right. I know Gene Barella was a rat and never, and never a made guy. But my question is, was he really as feared on the streets as some articles make him out to be? No, no, and no. There you go. That's going to answer that. And I'm going to leave it there. Uh, are you going to do a show on the Dixie Mafia and the state line mob? 100% new platform uh, that is coming. Uh, are there, okay, so uh, Joey Merlino is now off house arrest. What can we expect from him? Are the feds going to be watching close? Listen, the feds are going to, the, the, the feds on Joey Merlino are like a tick on his balls. They're not going to leave the guy alone. Uh, they're going to assert shit, make shit up. Uh, if Joey goes to swim in a fucking pool, they're going to say he like fucking shook down the guy for the money to get into the pool and then went swimming just to throw it in his face. That's what the feds always do to Joey. That's what they're always going to fucking do. Joey is like everybody else. Uh, COVID is fucking all over Florida. So I can't imagine Joey's doing a whole lot more than looking out the window on how the fuck did I end up here? Uh, but now Joey, Joey's just going to be Joey and lay low and try to live his fucking life and move on with his life. Uh, you know, that's what I think he's going to do. Uh, let's see with all the electronic surveillance available to the FBI, do they even need informants anymore? It's a great question, but the answer is yes, because they need somebody to corroborate all their nonsense and bullshit. It's one thing to have a wiretap, but they need somebody to back up their fucking delusions. I mean, it's as simple as that. It doesn't get any better than that. Um, okay. Do mobsters have a type of music that they listen to? Uh, everybody's different. Uh, I know somebody in South Philly who loves Dean Martin. Uh, I know another guy in South Philly who loves Motown. Christ, this guy, the Leprechaun. That's what we're going to call him. I call him the Leprechaun. He loves fucking Motown. I mean, loves fucking Motown. Uh, I could be down there. I, I could throw some money in the jukebox, right? And maybe it's like, I don't know, Aerosmith or some bullshit. And within a couple of minutes, I hear zip. Everything goes silent. And then the four tops so the temptations start to play. I look over and there he is. Diddy bopping and singing his songs to Motown. Uh, And I swear he does that just to fuck with me. He probably didn't even know I played the music, but the leprechaun loves his fucking Motown. You should hear him sing. It's funny. Uh, I I heard his father was a lounge singer. Uh, So it's interesting to see him kind of shuffling around singing, you know, Uh, him and his brother. Good guys. Very good guys. Uh, Some guys here in New York, they love Sinatra. It just depends on who you are and what you like. 
Uh, there is nothing like sitting in a bar with a, with, with a mob guy uh, who you know is a serious guy. Maybe he's a killer. And he's sitting right next to you drinking a scotch. You know, he taps his hands. Uh, let, let me let me let me rephrase this. Oh, boy. All right. So there's nothing like sitting in a bar with a mafia guy who you know is a serious guy who, you know, is probably legitimately killed people. And there he is sitting right next to you, drinking a scotch, tapping his hand off his glass, singing 1950s doo-wop songs. If that ain't living, I don't know what the fuck is. All these guys that I might have mentioned, not even 60, that tells you anything. Not even 60 years old. So yeah, everybody listens to different kinds of, uh, different kinds of uh, music. Um, let's see, I'm scanning through some of these. All right, what do you think would be the worst? What do, what do you think would be the worst to be a fly on the wall? Mad Sam's basement or the apartment above the Gemini Lounge? Ooh, that's a tough one, uh, no doubt. But honestly, I've, I've never been able to wrap my head around Joey Messino and Vito Rizzuto hiding in a closet in a basement ready to whack Philip uh, Dominic Trinchera, Alphonse Indelicato, and, and Philip uh, Giacone. I, 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 I can't imagine that. But, but if I had to be a fly on the wall, probably the worst place you could probably be is above the Gemini Lounge, I'll be honest with you. Ah, okay, we got a hockey question. Do you think the Blackhawks are going to get past the Golden Showers? Uh, he means the Las Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, no, I don't. Chicago doesn't have depth. Uh, Chicago has sort of the same problem that Pittsburgh is having now. Uh, they have two top forwards who have been together forever and and, and not a relatively young team behind them. Uh, Vegas, meanwhile, is probably the most well-adapted team uh, as far as balancing the roster. I marvel at what they have been able to do in a relatively short period of time. Uh, I just don't see anybody being good enough to beat them coming out of the West. I think your Stanley Cup final is going to be the Philadelphia Flyers. Yay. Oh, so I can hear all the South Philly assholes cheering now. Hey, Claude Giroux, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Uh, I think it's going to be the Flyers and the Las Vegas and the Stanley Cup. That's the way I see it. I think those are the two best teams in the NHL right now. And we'll see. We'll see. Uh, and if you're from South Philly and you're asking me to bet on hockey, don't ask. Because last year a guy fucking came to me asking about the playoffs. I gave him a bad tip on the Bruins. I thought he was going to kill me. <laughs> All right. Uh, who is the that latest mob boss in the 1920s. I really don't understand your question, but it, but to be honest, I mean, maybe you mean the best or the worst. Uh, so I don't know. Al Capone uh, has the you know. I, I don't know if anybody in the 1920s has the, the 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 power that Al Capone does in a relatively small area. But but let's let's be honest. It's a power that was controlled by New York, uh, not on Capone's own volition. Uh, Capone only had a six-year run at the top in Chicago. So in many ways, you know, I would love to see what Capone could have done, uh, say, 10, 15 years in control. Uh, that era of the mob was just a who's who, and, and probably the most inept one would have been Joe the Boss Massaria, just given his ego and what was coming down the pike for him just a few short laters, years later. Uh, okay, so this part, and I'm going to, I don't want to, all right, so somebody wants me to bash Takashi six nine. I just I don't have it in me to do that today. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right, fuck it. I'll let this be the last question. Uh, Takashi six nine. First of all, he's a rat piece of shit bastard. Uh, but here's the here's the thing. Listen, he could be a rat, and people can hate him for being a rat. But society is fucking changed, and that is the biggest goddamn problem. Uh, the, listen, the kid could make 15, 20 fucking million, 30 million fucking dollars. I really don't give a fuck what the kid makes because I think his music fucking sucks. I don't understand any of it. I literally understand gaba gooby, gaba gooey, gaba gaba, whatever the fuck that shit is. It sounds like fucking, uh, fucking, uh, fucking leprechauns masturbating in unison. I don't fucking know. I don't understand none of his music. I don't understand his stupid fucking shark teeth. I don't understand his fucking rainbow hair. I don't get any of it. Uh, I can tell you one thing. He wasn't a tough kid. He's a bitch. I can tell you that much. He used to run. He used to get beat up all the time. He doesn't tell anybody that. Uh, and so what Takashi 6 9 does, he gets involved with the fucking Trey 6 9s uh, because he wants to appear tough. And they take advantage of him. And they beat the piss out of him. They threaten to do this, that, and the third. And what does he do? He rats on everybody because he doesn't want to go to jail. Uh, he tries to give the judge some bullshit about, oh, you know, this. they did this to me. I didn't do nothing to them. He's a bitch. He's a punk. But that being said, the bigger issue is then he comes out with this gaba gaba 
give head to a job at a hut song, whatever the fuck it was that, that I couldn't understand that I needed a fucking translation for, uh, gets like 250 million views in like a week. That tells you that society is now accepting rats. First of all, let me tell you how it's going to end for this kid. He's going to get killed. If you think that you think for if three years from now he's still alive, I put a hundred thousand dollars that he's not. They're going to kill him, and he's got what's coming to him. I hate because it's one thing to be a rat; it's another to put out a a video with yourself laughing with a rat face poking fun at the people you ratted out, saying you ain't worried. Fuck them. Do you know what they do to a kid? Do you know what they're going to do to a kid like that? Let me tell you how it's also going to happen. He's he's his little house arrest bullshit. I believe has ended. But he's going to have to have lifetime protection. A lot of people are very tough when they have FBI handlers around them or when they have security forces around them. They're going to mouth off and do whatever the fuck they want because who's going to take on 12 guys with a gun? But what is going to happen is somebody on his security team ain't going to fucking like him. And they're going to make a call one day and they're going to say, by the way, guess who I'm with? The rainbow rat. And then guess what's going to happen? Car's going to pull up and he's going to take 75, 80 shots from an AK-47. And he's going to fucking deserve it because he's a piece of shit. But society, I never thought I would see the day when a rat could still sell 250 million fucking downloads or albums, whatever the fuck it is. I don't really pay attention to the fucking jerk off. But society's changed. Society is changing. Look at all the rats that are doing everything they're doing now. Do you think you could have done that shit 20 years ago? Fuck no. 20 years ago, if any of these jerk-offs came to walk in their old neighborhoods, they'd be killed. Now, they roll right through like it's nothing. Because who's going to say nothing to them? Uh, so the kid's a piece of shit. He's going to get what's coming to him. Uh, other mob rats can have like, you know, oh, how to say this. Uh, there are some mob rats out there that are in love with Takashi. And maybe they met Takashi on their grinder accounts. You know, maybe that's what it is. Maybe they want Takashi to, to sit on their lap so they could twirl his rainbow hair in their hands. Fucking pricks. I don't know. I, the, the kid's not going to live. Uh, he probably doesn't deserve to live. Especially if he had just done what he did, took his money and said, all right, whatever. I'm going to, you know, put out new albums, new material, like, you know, from fucking Tahiti. Uh, then that would be one thing. But the minute that you start to come back to Brooklyn and you start to talk shit about the guys you ratted out, you're, you're going to get killed. You're going to deserve it because you're a stupid bastard. That's the reality of it. Is he talented? I don't think so. Uh, but then again, I'm, I'm really not in that genre of music. So maybe Gaba Traba, Blow Jabba Jabba, maybe that's like popular. You know, personally, I think auto-tune sounds like you stuck a fucking whistle up a fucking midget's ass. That's personally what, what I think that sounds like. You don't have talent to do auto-tune. Who wants to sound like a fucking computer-generated robot getting fucked in the ass? That's the way I kind of see it. But that's just me. Then again, I listen to Frank Sinatra. Not everybody likes Frank. So, <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope that suffices. And what the fuck is Takashi anyway? Takashi, it's like, is it Chinese or something? Takashi, Kashi, Kashi makes like those shitty fucking meals. Kashi's, what are they called? Kashi's the fucking, uh, oh god, the, the, that f those fucking horrible fake meals that people that are on diets gotta eat. I don't even know what you call it. It's like tofu. What is ta is Kashi tofu? Stick tofu up your ass, prick. All right. So all that being said, that is what we're gonna do for this week. I had three or four more, but but ladies and gents, I'm fucking done. I'm fucking spent. I'm exhausted. 85 questions. That's a lot. That's a lot of nonsense and a lot of bullshit. All right. So all that being said, we will be back in two weeks. You already know the show we're going to cover. Uh, I will post the Q&A links probably next week uh, or maybe even a couple of days, probably Monday or Tuesday. And you'll have fucking 14 days to fucking give me your vomit inducing repetitive questions. Uh, all that being said, stay safe and we will see you in two weeks. <laughs>